You're listening to the Sports Fix. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Quick Lane at Valley Ford Truck, home of the low price tire guarantee. Quicklane.com slash Valley Ford Truck. Sports Fix listeners, don't wait all day or all week to get in on the fun. The party doesn't stop when we go off the air all week long. The Sports Fix social media sites are your one-stop shop for all things Cleveland sports. Jump over to Facebook.com slash The Sports Fix. Facebook.com slash The Sports Fix and become a fan today because we love fans and they create some of the best sports talk in town, Daddy. You'll enjoy talking to your fellow Cleveland sports fans on The Sports Fix fan page. And if Twitter's your thing, well, you know how we do it. Tweet with us at the Sports Fix CLE. It's that simple. Twitter.com slash the Sports Fix CLE, baby. Chat live with the crew during all your favorite Cleveland sports events, tickets and contests and trivia and so much more. Get with us today, the Sports Fix on social media. Facebook.com slash the Sports Fix. Tweet with us at the Sports Fix CLE. Join, Join the, the Sports, sports Fix, fix on, on Facebook and, and Twitter today. today. I'm Tyler Zeller from the Cleveland Cavaliers, and you're listening to the Sports Fix. Live in Ohio, it's time to get your fix. The Sports Fix. Welcome in, everybody. We are live Tuesday. July 1st, crossing over, Bone Thugs and Harmony said it best. It is the first of the month, baby. Cannot believe the first six months are complete, like down and in the books. And we are into the second half of the year already. And man, so many things going on. Uh, Personally with me, with the show, all kinds of stuff, uh, things coming on the horizon Man, when we come back from the holiday break, then I think we'll talk about some things here that are coming up in the future. I cannot wait. But it's just one of those times where, man, the winds are circling and things are... Opportunity, baby, is is a foot at the Circle K. But, you know, that's things to talk about for another day. But just looking here, being introspective, it's amazing. We say it, you know, I, I, at the beginning of every month, I do the, wow, you know, time's going fast. But, man, look at it. I mean, really... Before you know it, man, it's we're gonna be singing jingle bells, man, and 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 talking about resolutions for 2015. That is just amazing, man. It just shows you to do as much as you can, get it in. If there is something that you want to do, go do it, go get it done. Because before you know it, it'll be the time will have passed. And anyways, and you know what? But don't do like the Indians did the last couple of days. Although some great baseball, but like if you're a pure baseball guy, but uh, don't try to set that kind of history, man. It's never good. And it's so funny. Yesterday we're talking about things that, uh, you know, with Josh Tomlin, the, the good side of making history, eh, not so good here, man. Again, fan, Fantastic baseball, and it just uh, turned out to be on the wrong side of the ledger. But the Indians, uh, I believe, matter of fact, what are they? Five five hits since since Jan Gomes went yard a couple of games ago. Um, definitely some struggles offensively. They faced some good pitching. They made some pitching look good. Uh, you know, three. I'll, I'll talk about more about this. We've got Mike Brandenberry coming up in a little bit, just about ten minutes from now talk some Indians baseball, but with the Indians being on the other side of the one hitter Saturday, and then the last two games, three consecutive games, a team involved in a one hitter. I don't know if that's ever been done. I know only seven times in history, or at least in the last 100 years in recorded history, has a team been no hit in back-to-back games but man I you gotta think that when you add Tomlin's game from Saturday on top of it no team can say that they've been involved in three straight maybe so though and maybe Mike Brandenberry will have the answer or maybe one of you guys do but uh anyways Indians it was a great game falls short last night and we're gonna talk about all of that with Mike Brandenberry here we'll kind of look back at the first half of the season 81 down 81 to go Mike Brandenberry here always a great time Dr. Football's in the house today bill check us he's always with us on tuesdays we talk about whatever's in the news and the browns and all of that news is slow today we're going to just have a fun football conversation with dr football we're just going to talk outside of the quarterbacks because that one's a discussion all by itself 
top five stories that are the most important, you know, things to how the season's going to go in spring training. I've got my list. I know Dr. Football's got his. We'll talk about some of the things that we look to be interested in watching here as Brown's training camp comes up. We'll talk about, of course, Team USA's at it. I know Mike Brandenberry can't wait to talk about that as well. All of that, your takes, and the big one. Matter of fact, we'll, we'll start off the show here talking Kyrie Irving, of course, uh, all the speculation throughout the season, it's all come to an end. The first thing the Cavaliers did at 12.01 yesterday was go to New Jersey, drop $90 million in the lap of Kyrie Irving. He took the uh, took the bait, if you will. It, it really, and I got to be honest, all along, you know, and, and even I said, hey, the Cavaliers are not going to get caught holding the basket. But all along, if Kyrie Irving had turned it down, that extension, you're talking about unprecedented. You're talking about uncharted waters. I mean, really, uh, you know, it's one thing for a guy to do what uh, what LeBron did in that situation and make a shorter deal, which is what some people, including myself, thought might happen. But the people that thought that, that Kyrie Irving was in a position to just look at the Cavs and say, Keepeth your money, young man. I'm going to go west. I, that was really highly unlikely. But the Cavaliers have gone all in. Dan Gilbert likes that term. He owns a casino. They have gone all in. Kyrie Irving, Andrew Wiggins is clearly going to be the one-two combination of the future here. So we're going to talk about that. Free agency is underway. Cavaliers on the clock, as you say here, is what's next. And then I'll tell you what, I, I see tra- I see some trade possibilities out there. Everybody, of course, looking at the big fish. I think this free agency is really going to start rolling once the big fish fall. And I look for a lot of medium players to really cash in big here. But we're talking about that. Cavaliers, Kyrie, Indians, NFL, Browns, so much more with you, baby. So let's kick things off. Welcome into the Sports Fix. I am your host, the Big Daddy on the microphone. They call me J-Rock. My mama called me Jerry Myers. I am calling myself glad to be here every day. You like how I did that. That was actually luck that it worked out that way. But hey, if you keep talking fast enough, occasionally it goes together well. Hey, thank you guys so much for being with us. Whether you're listening on on the sportsfix.net, on Spreaker and Mixler and TuneIn and the TuneIn radio app worldwide and all of you listening 24 hours a day throughout the day here on Digital Delay on iHeartRadio, iTunes, Stitcher Radio, SoundCloud, Podcasts, all of the different platforms that you guys enjoy the show. Thank you guys for being here. I say it all the time. Let's do it. We want to hear from you. This is our show, your show. We do this thing together. Pick up the phone. Give me a call, 216-539-7535, 216-539-7535 is the number to call, or we're going to open the phone lines back up again later on in the show, by the way, because we've got Mike coming on just about ooh, seven minutes from now. We've got Dr. Football after that, so if you don't get in early, we'll get you in late. We'll open up the phones at the end of the show, 216-539-7535. Get to the Facebook and the Twitter if you can't use your phones, if you're at work, a great way to stay Stay in touch with the show. Tweet with us at the Sports Fix CLE, or you can hit us up on Facebook, facebook.com slash the Sports Fix. Hit us up either way. Great ways to stay in touch with the show. Facebook.com slash the Sports Fix. Make sure you like the show while you're there. Nearly 21,000 fans on Facebook. Join them and Tweet with us at the Sports Fix CLE. Remember, you can email us at all hours of the day, the Sports Fix at AOL.com. Hey, I can't do 140 characters either. I got words to say. Use your email, the Sports Fix at AOL.com. And remember, everything you need to know, it's right there at the Sports Fix.net. So keep it bookmarked, and that's everything. You got your social media, you got your replays of the show, you got pictures of yours truly, everything you need. The sponsor banners, it's right there, the Sports Fix.net. All right, guys. Hey, let's roll into the show. Talk about Kyrie Irving. I want to kick off a little bit. We'll talk some Cavs because they kicked it off last night as expected. I mean, obviously, as expected, the Cavaliers making the offer to Kyrie Irving for the full five-year max contract deal, which is a little over $90 million. It'll actually... It's actually funny because they offer him, you know, what we call a max contract, but you can't even put an actual dollar amount on it until I think it's... With July 10th, 
when they set the salary cap for the next season. So actually it's just, you know, it's kind of an understanding that's going to be whatever that number is. So, but it's going to be somewhere in the range of, of 90, 91 million dollars. But because they gave him the five year extension, which is going to be interesting in the future. You guys, I know this is like, you know, kind of the technical aspect of a contract, but in the new collective bargaining agreement, the way they've got it, a team can, only designate one player as their designated player. Kind of, it's kind of like, it's not like the franchise tag, but it's kind of like designating a guy, your franchise guy. And what it does is it allows you to offer that fifth year uh, instead of just a four year extension. Cause remember they capped the extensions and stuff in the NBA with the new CBA. So, and they want that because they want shorter contracts because it raises the pay scale faster than if everybody's locked in under long-term deals. Um, so, but anyways, uh, because of that, when Andrew Wiggins contract, his rookie contract is up, what, three or four years from now, he will only be able to sign, assuming that Kyrie Irving is still on the team, Wiggins will not be able to do a five year. They will only be able to offer him four years because you can only have that one guy that you offer that extra fifth year to. So by doing that now, they have said until Kyrie Irving is off the team, he gets that designation. So they wouldn't be able to. So maybe nothing now, but who knows in the future? Yeah, maybe that's an issue. Maybe not, but keep that in mind maybe years from now. But uh, with uh, bonus uh, bonuses and incentives for making all-star games and championships and different appearances, uh, that contract for Kyrie Irving could actually top three figures there could get over a hundred million dollars but either way not a bad set of change for him and Kyrie Irving uh, was about two o'clock in the morning sent out a tweet that he was all in with Cleveland just like uh, I said Dan Gilbert all in with Kyrie Irving so we'll see but now now the equation changes when it comes to Kyrie Irving because all the talk, speculation, will he stay, won't he stay, does he want to stay, is he good? Is he the, the guy to build a franchise around, is he selfish, is he a team player, and trust me, everybody's got opinions, and, and not not everybody's wrong. There's a lot of, lot of things about Kyrie Irving, but now he's here, now the commitment has been made, and it'll be interesting to see on both ends. From I'm curious to see if that changes... Because, you know, hey, say what you want, but being a kid with uh, with uh, that on the verge decisions and, and uh, you know, the franchise changing, you know, three head coaches. Technically, you know, these guys will have had three head coaches within 15 months and the last bit of Byron Scott and then Mike Brown and then Coach Blatt. So, uh, you know, all of that, the uncertain, maybe. Maybe this loosens him up, too. It'll be interesting to see the different style of play. I mean, because whether you think this was the right decision or not, whether you think they should not have gone forward with Kyrie or whether you are dancing on the ceiling, this is the move that's been made. It is the commitment that's been made. And what the Cavs are saying is that Batman and Robin are in the house. Our Batman and Robin are going to be Andrew Wiggins and Kyrie Irving. And that, I mean, that's what they're saying. That's the pair. And I, I don't want to put pressure on those as a duo, but though they are going to pair those two up and put the pieces around them. And I think that preferably they'd prefer that to be a three man kind of a, a mix there when you throw Dion waiters in there too. And so, but anyways, that is the commitment the Cavaliers have made and what comes next will be very interesting as far as where they go in free agency. I know everybody is, you know, looking at, at, LeBron and by the way I mean it a lot of these middle tier guys everybody that's not pretty much LeBron Carmelo those top couple of guys the once those contracts go down man some of these teams that have these huge amounts of salary cap and they don't get LeBron and they don't get because I mean regardless of where Carmelo and LeBron go only one team is going to get a player. Like, like they're they they can't go to five different teams, even though five different teams have a ton of salary cap. So that money is going to have to be spent, and these teams are going to have a truckload of money to throw at all the rest of these free agents. So you are definitely going to see, as you usually do, some more of those just crazy uh, market changing deals again. Uh, oh, you know, hey, Cavaliers, you know, got themselves in in a moderately bad deal with Jarrett Jack because you overpay a lot of the times in free agency, you know, and you're paying for past performance instead of future results. So, you know, I do believe you can get some help in free agency, but I think a trade is where this team is really going to do something because they got a ton of room 
and some team out there needs salary cap relief and there's good there's there's a lot of players out there free agency I see limited options. There's a couple of players I'd like. Channing Fry is somebody I think they're interested in. Obviously, Spencer Halls. Uh, you know, Gar- Gortat is somebody that I would think about. Just, I, I mean, these are complimentary pieces. Um, you know, some of the restricted free agents, Monroe. Um, there's some guys. But see, restricted free agency is tricky because obviously the team always has the right to match the offer. So then you really got to overpay and still Sometimes you overpay and the team still matches the contract. So it's a risk to, to plan on getting anybody and extracting them in restricted free agency. I think trading, I think coming up soon here, I think the Cavs will use that salary cap room, but more likely in a trade than in uh, in signing a group of a big money, a couple of big money players, you know, because they can do that and it'll be easier. And then you can, you can, package it and you know put it together the right way but uh i i think they'll be very active i think that they may wait out just like i said the market may may you know you're gonna see i don't know if you're gonna see players flying off the shelves although i throw this out there because if i'm the Cavs, especially if i have moved on with the whole lebron pipe dream thing and i'm ready to be realistic about this thing if i'm the Cavs. I know that a lot of these players are sitting back waiting for the the market to be set, so to speak, uh, with LeBron and these guys. Man, if there's somebody that you think, I mean, if you you want to go get them, go get them now while they're kind of you know waiting waiting it out. I mean, if there's somebody you want, go be aggressive. Otherwise, wait out the market. I think that they, I don't think they have a lot of choice because I do think a lot of these players are going to sit tight and wait because until see, here's the other thing too is a lot of these uh, other free agents are going to be pieces that whatever team signs LeBron, signs Carmelo Anthony, whatever team does that, then these are going to be the pieces that will make the package, whether it's Adam Pau Gasol or Luau Dang or whatever. You know, there's a lot of these guys out there. So I, I got to say that a lot of them, if I was them, I wouldn't commit to anywhere else until I knew, you know, where where the big players were going to land because then you could see the landscape and know, you know, what what teams where, who's odds, all that. It, it, to me, I think that, you know, for as much as the target date was midnight, July 1st, a lot of phone calls made. But until those big stones drop, a lot of the other stuff can't happen because players won't do it. I mean, I wouldn't do it either. So, so now, now the wait is kind of on. Meanwhile, I don't know. Flip the ESPN right now. And let me know. Somebody has LeBron taking out his trash this morning because I expect that kind of ridiculousness to start going on over the rest of this week as we update when people go to the mailbox and all of that. You know, hey, listen. For as much as as I get on LeBron because of the Cleveland stuff, I should tell you, I saw this video on YouTube, and yeah, you know, hey everybody's human and it you just see the ridiculousness it was it was a silly video somebody on their phone a phone journalist uh, lebron was at a party and you know he was just he, he was by himself he didn't even have a truckload of security around him or nothing and this guy's like in the valet area as lebron's just waiting for him to bring his car and he's just shoving his phone in his face and he's hey lebron are the heat uh, are the heat fans in trouble hey lebron what do you got to say you know and the guy's getting his car and listen i don't feel bad for anybody in the spotlight that is the trade off for making that money and for being in that spotlight but you're watching him and the guy won't stop and he just keeps going and you know okay even if you're you know you're asking a guy a question once he doesn't answer the first question or two it's like those tmz guys they drive me nuts once a guy doesn't answer the first question or two just leave him be but this guy's keep going leaning down in the window just trying to get a trying to get a glimpse of of him putting the car in drive and i'm like man i would have a bit of a chip on my shoulder sometimes with stuff like that too but then again there's a difference between having a chip on your shoulder and being an egotistical ass let's just clarify that but even i you know even it's something when it it makes you go oh man even i felt a little bad for the guy watching this video because you multiply that by a hundred and that's life on a daily basis but again as i say all the time you don't have to do that because as much as you can benefit financially and socially and all of that by playing basketball, 
I mean, you could, you know, you could go do a lot of other things where people don't follow you with a camera. But it, still, it was just it's like, man, wow. Uh, anyways, so I'm going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to keep the conversation going. We'll switch to baseball. Of course, we'll jump back to this. And this week, going to be interesting to watch. But Mike Brandenberry from Did the Tribe Win Last Night.com going to join us next. We'll talk about three straight one hit games, first half trends, and so much more. Talking Tribe with Mike Brandenberry next on the Sports Fix. The Sports Fix, the show that asks the question. What you talking about? 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 We'll be right back. Before we go to the break, guys, I want to talk to you just a second about our friends at GV Art and Design. Baseball's here once again. Cleveland, of course, excited. And GV Artwork teaming up with the Indians. And they're both going to knock it out of the park this season. And listen to some of the new designs they've got for Cleveland baseball fans everywhere. They've dug out an old classic. And they're bringing the heat with the new wild thing, Give them the Heater Ricky design. GV Artwork is teaming up with Cleveland fan favorite Michael Brantley and created a custom Dr. Smooth t-shirt plus don't forget they've got the cleveland that i glove collection new tribal and cleveland that i love designs for women and so much more you can get gv artwork designs on the website gvartwork.com and don't forget to use the sales code fix 10 that's fix one zero and you'll save 10 percent on your purchase or you can check out their new store in lakewood on detroit avenue check them out in the indians team shops and so much more cleveland that we all love gv art and design. It's not just a shirt, it's a statement. Hello Cleveland, this is WWE Hall of Famer Mick Foley and you are listening to the Sports Fix. Yeah! The engines are cranking and purring and that can only mean one thing. Bike nights are back at Harry Buffalo North Olmstead. Rev up your hogs and head on down to Harry Buffalo North Olmstead every Monday night. Enjoy $3, $3 drinks, drinks and beers, beers $5 pizzas, and crazy, crazy wing specials, specials for, for all bikers, bikers. All on their open patio. Woo-hoo! Hot bikes, good friends, and great times are waiting for you. 4824 Great Northern Boulevard, right outside Great Northern Mall. Monday bike nights at Harry Buffalo. The, the proud, proud sponsor, sponsor of the Sports, sports Fix. fix. Sports Fix listeners, like us on Facebook today. Facebook.com slash the Sports Fix. Have you gotten your copy of Cleveland's Finest yet? Highlighting the best moments, players, and media members in Cleveland sports history? depth personal interviews with some of the top names in cleveland sports fill the pages of this incredible book cleveland's finest by vince mckee is this year's must-have book for every cleveland sports fan available now at amazon.com you're listening to the sports fix Welcome back to the Sports Fix Live here on the SportsFix.net, of course, on TuneIn and Spreaker and Mixler and on Digital Delay on iHeartRadio, the world's largest internet radio provider on iTunes and Stitcher Radio and SoundCloud and CarPlay, plus all the podcasts and all the other ways you listen to the show. Thank you guys for joining us. J-Rock, Jerry Myers, back with you here. Close the phone lines because my man Mike Brandenberry is about to join me. But as always, open to you, baby. Hit us up on Facebook and Twitter. Facebook.com slash the Sports Fix. Tweet with us at the Sports Fix. CLE. Always to stay in touch with the show. And uh, real quick, as we set the stage here, talking Indians baseball. And uh, I mentioned you know, coming off yesterday, we were talking, recapping the weekend and you know, the the good part of history, the, the first of the trifecta of one hitters, if you will, as we talked about Josh Tomlin the other night. Man, it's never as much fun when you're on the backside of that, and uh, that's where the Indians sit right now, as uh, not only have they, and this one I'm still waiting, and I'm going to ask Mike here in a second, uh, I don't know if any team between both sides of the ledger have been involved in three consecutive one-hit games uh, even though, you know, like I said, one was 
pro Indians, and then the last two, we know how they've went. With the two, I can definitely tell you that the Indians became only the, as Bruce put in the chat room, third American League team, but they became the seventh team period since uh, the last 100 years to do the feat that they've done here with the uh, one-hitters consecutive games. Check this out. Since 1914, the only other teams to do that were the Reds in 2013 last year, early part of last year. They also were one hit in back-to-back games. The Astros in 08, the Mets in 60, man, it was a long time, from 65. It wasn't until 08 before it happened again. The uh, the Mets, the White Sox in 1917, and the old Boston Braves in 1916, and uh, the Indians have now made that bad kind of history as well. Uh, I'm not even playing this going for three in a row garbage There's not a chance it's not happening they'll they'll take care of business tonight but definitely not good good baseball though and Corey kluber the tough luck loser we'll talk about all of that but i'm gonna have mike join us here going to the phone lines mike brandenberry from did the tribe win last night.com mike what's happening my man what's going on what's up with you not much. I, I'm ready to break down all three hits that the Indians have had in the last 21 innings. I know. He's been sending me these texts all morning like, all right, and then we can talk about all five hits they've gotten in the last three weeks. And, and I'm like, all right, man, it's going to be one of those days. But let's, uh, you know, seriously, let me start by asking. I'm sure you heard me while I was bringing you up there. Is this the first time a team has been involved in three consecutive no hitters with with obviously the other side of the the ledger on Saturday night, but I cannot find it. Yeah, I look at it, but I can't find it uh, anywhere that I've looked around. I haven't looked, but I haven't heard anyone mention it um, last night during the game or, or anywhere this morning. So if if it isn't the first time that a team's been involved in three straight one hitters. It's got to be a very long time since it's happened. I, I know off the top of my head, I can't, I can't think of anything in my lifetime, Indians involved or not. Well, think um, about it. Like if, this, so if, it's an it's an oddity, if not a first time occurrence. If only seven teams have done the back to back one hitters like that, then you got to think the odds would be infinitesimal that some some team would have been involved in three in a row like that man so uh but regardless man i mean if you're into that traditional old school baseball the last couple of days of indians baseball have been right up your alley baby that's for sure yeah um it's as strange as it seems um Ah, wait a minute. Bruce in the chat room, real quick, before we go on to that subject, he says the uh, New York Mets were one hit three days in a row. So they were one hit three days in a row. So I guess this would be the second time it's happened, period. But uh, not, and obviously they're going for the wrong part of the record there. But there you go. So the Mets did it before, too. That was probably those really terrible Mets, too, back in the early 60s. How much you want to bet that's one of those bad Mets teams there? But anyway, so it has, that's the only only other time it's happened is right there. The Mets have apparently been one hit three games in a row. So the Indians still have goals for tonight then. They would be the first American League team to do it. They would set the American League record and they would tie the Major League record. Come on. Let's not talk about that. Indians are going to hit the ball tonight. Let's let's get some positive mojo going here. They're going to be fine, even, even though... The last couple of days haven't gone so well. What are they, 3 for 63 in the last uh, 21 innings or so? 3 for 64, but who's counting? Exactly? There you go. Um, <laughs> since, since Jan Gomes' home run on Saturday night. So your last 21 and a third innings, the Indians are 3 for 64. And other good numbers I was texting you this morning is uh, yes. Nick Swisher's 5 for 49 <laughs> since coming off the DL. And as Drupal Cabrera, they said this one on the broadcast last night, but he is one for 39 with runners in scoring position on the season. That's not just a, a on the season. Number. That's, that's for the year. Are you serious? They, I did not notice Matt that. Underwood even said that the one run he drove in was in a 10 to 1 game. Wow. Now, I didn't, I did, I I didn't did look not that up, that. but I, I do know that, that that is exactly what Matt Underwood said. One Wait, isn't for that 39, nuts, though? And his one was in a blowout. I didn't even notice it, and you either. We've talked. We've been doing the whole first half. Did not even notice that for the season, 
he was that bad with runners in scoring position, man. Wow. Yeah. So I know, you know, I've been thinking all morning because I know we're going to come on here and we're going to talk about the Indians and, of course, their offensive struggles in the last couple of days is a hot topic. And, I mean, to be honest, I mean, these weird things do happen, even though we just, you know, basically defined a historical context where where it really hasn't happened. You know, <laughs> teams go through slumps and go through bad slumps in a yeah. year. And, I mean, you know, over a couple of days, it definitely doesn't look pretty, Jerry. But in the same sense, you know, I don't think you, you go hammering any – any panic buttons because of a couple days. No, because I'll tell you what. For me, I think for me, the first half and and what we've seen as a whole is more reason to be concerned than to just be concerned over the last couple days. Absolutely. And yesterday I, I talked and I said we would talk some more about this, but how dead on you were when you and I talked all winter and on and off the air and in the spring about this, your concerns with the starting pitching and like the way I looked at it, which if everything goes right, you know, and you would always say that, well, yeah, but if these things go wrong, I'm worried about this, this, and this. And you really were just Nostradamus on the starting rotation here. That was your concern the whole winter. And I was talking about that uh, yesterday, but you know, even uh, the flip side of that is, as Dan Dan Wismar and I were saying yesterday, and he's we keep going back to this, is all the things, all the crap things that have happened, the bad, ter- no, record-settingly bad defense and all of that, the Indians are only four games worse than they were after 81 games last year. They're, you know, they're, that's, that's statistically irrelevant from year to year when you realize how, I mean, Axford fallen off right away and an error a game for most of the first half. What do they got? 70 and 81 games or something like that to 71 and 81 games, whatever. Um, I mean, guys hitting 100 for most of the first half of the season, some of them. I mean, all of these things. Every starting pitcher except Kluber has fallen off the wagon at one point or another or gotten hurt, and here they sit practically identical to the record they had at the same point last year. It sounds you're definitely the glass half full to my half empty because, because that's all correct. But in the same breath, I think all of those things that you listed are good reasons to have some serious concerns for the second half of the year. And and for me, I think the topic for the next four weeks, uh, beginning today, I mean, we're at the official halfway point of the season. Um, You know, yesterday was game 82. Today is July 1st. But for me, for the next four weeks, are the Indians buyers or sellers? And, And it's easy to say that they're buyers, but I guess before you can buy, one of the questions I would ask is, what are you looking to buy? Because if you are going to sum up the first half of this season, I mean, I think the only thing that's been consistent is their inconsistencies. Yes. I mean, they can't catch on a regular basis. Um, they don't hit on a regular basis. And they don't pitch on a regular basis. And and so in order to be a buyer, you know, you got to have something to buy. And and I think also the reality of it is if you're going to buy, especially in this five-team wild card era where there's eight or nine teams in it at the trade deadline, the sellers are always going to be asking for the moon and the stars um, and, and, and hoping to get somebody to bite. And if you're in the Indian situation right now, and you look at it on July 1st, There's no one player out there. Make up any trade you want, even if it's unreasonable. Um, There's no one player that the Indians can trade for that fixes all of their problems. And that's before you get into conversations of what you would have to give up for that player. So, I mean, whether you think they're a starting pitcher away or a middle-of-the-order bat or, you know, someone that can maybe play up the middle and give you good defense, it doesn't solve the other problems. And I, and I think, you know, if, if you can't figure out what you should be buying, then you probably shouldn't be buying. And, and for me, for the next four weeks, I think – you know, I think to make it as simple as it can be, 
in order for the Indians to be buyers and to really go after it in the second half, they have to get better play out of the guys on this roster right now before they can even entertain the idea of getting them help, regardless of what their record is versus last year or where they sit in the standings, because you can't justify trading trading pieces away or trying to tinker with your roster to win right now when that one player probably isn't going to move the line. Yeah, you know, I'm sitting here listening to you and I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to say when you're done. And I'm just like, man, it's just killed this conversation because I just want to go, damn, man. I can make right, it work man. because I've thought of other things this morning, oh, too. And, yeah. and I'll, we'll just we'll just keep going with my sinking ship or what, what I've thought of. But, you know, the thing is, I think in the short term, Jerry, <laughs> that really makes it worse and goes along with the guys on this roster just have to play better if they're going to get in, if they're really going to get into a playoff push this year. The Knicks Swishers have to play better. Jason Kipnis has to play better. Yeah, better. The Dribble Cabrera has to play better. And Carlos Santana has to, you know, continue to to have June has to bleed into July and August. I mean that June can't be a fluke. It it, it has to be a continued upward trend. And, you know, I think that's the frustrating part is those guys are supposed to be the core, you know, the quote star players of this team. And, and they're really the ones who have underperformed. If you go around the field and you look at it one player at a time, most of the other guys, at least in their lineup, are playing at the level you would expect or above. And so my, my sinking, my continued sinking ship is it's not like you can go it's not like you can go to the minor leagues and maybe promote somebody that's maybe not quite ready because you're not benching any of those guys. I mean, it's not like you can say, well, you know, this is a little earlier than what we expected, but let's give a, let's give a guy a shot. Not to mention three guys that they would maybe entertain that on all got hurt at Akron in the last week. So you can't, you know, if you're in love with Francisco Lindor and you want to promote him, you can't. He has a broken nose right now. I know. Um, if you like Joey Wendell or you like Tyler Naquin, you know, you can't promote those guys. They might be out for the year with broken bones in their hands. So when your farm system's not very deep and then, you know, three of your top ten prospects all go down in the span of a week, you know, it comes to me. It comes back to the guys on the twenty-five man roster, and if if they're going to really be contenders and not pretenders, you know, they have to play better. And I and I, it's it's simple and it's not so simple. All in the same all breath, right. I think. Let me jump in, and I'll start with Nick Swisher there, since that's a, a prime suspect target, easy one to go after. But okay, so what do you think? I mean, and you're pretty good with this kind of stuff. Not what we think, but when you say what you think the Indians are going to do. So no matter what, results be damned, do you think beating your head into the brick wall, the Indians are going to continue to trot Nick Swisher out there for the remainder of this season? I hate hate saying this, but they have no choice. They okay. have to run him out there every day, Jerry. Um, I, I will give them a lot, and Terry Francona, I will give them a ton of credit in the short term as they've played these National League games and they lose their DH that they've put Nick Swisher on the bench because, you know, the, the biggest optimist in the world, I don't know how you could justify that he is one of your eight best hitters or defenders at this point on, on this roster. He's not. When they put their lineup out there last night, I jokingly said to my wife, with Corey Kluber in the lineup, this is their best nine. And they went out <laughs> and got one hit. Um, Dude, I mean, it was Kluber, a joke, but Kluber, it's not Kluber that far that, off, Jerry. No, so, but Kluber, so Kluber answer, dropped that bunt. Kluber dropped that sure. butt in the game. I looked at my son and I said, man, Michael Bourne should take some lessons from Kluber. Fundament, I said, that's hey, how fundamentally you, sound. You know? Ooh, that's how so, you bunt the ball right there. I said, man, so you're right. <laughs> you know, but, but to answer your Swisher question, you know, I thought Paul Hoynes brought up a, a great topic in one of his stories this last weekend. 
they have to run Nick Swisher out there every day because he's dangerously getting close to becoming the next Travis Hafner. In that, I mean, he's their highest paid player. He has a huge salary, and they're committed to him for at least the next two seasons. I mean, they they're not they're not cutting him and eating you know forty million dollars left to be paid on that salary with the second half of this year and the next two years. So if you want to give them an additional day off here and there, you know, you want to do those things, go ahead. But, I mean, for the most part, I mean, I've definitely been one who's been critical of him of late, and I don't, I don't back away from any of those comments. And, you know, I, I don't think any one player is to blame for where they are. You know, we, we just outlined this is a, an 82-game season of inconsistencies as a team. But, but he he is the player who has had the biggest letdown of of what you expect versus what you've got, and I don't see where they have a choice because they're married to him for the next two and a half years, and nobody's taken him. So you've got to run him back out there, and you've got to try and fix him. Otherwise, you're stuck with a aging designated hitter who can no longer play the field and strikes out a ton. We've we've seen that before. And, there, and whose and, salary, you know, hamstrings you to get better as an organization. And I keep trying and you know, you joke you know, people and it's true, call me, you know, the the more positive half usually of these different bad conversations, but I am looking at Nick Swisher and even when I try, and I and I waited a while before I. There was a lot of people on the No Ohio Bro Ohio train before I was, but I'm there now. But I even going, okay, can he get any better? I honestly don't know. I don't know how much better he can be. I mean, maybe he can get himself up to to be in a. 240 hitter, you know, like, I mean, what else is he going to do? He strikes out 8,000 times. I mean, the only thing he likes better than to strike out looking is to strike out swinging. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if he can get any better. And all joking aside, what do you think? I mean, is he, we knew he was on the back nine, clearly, and the Indians overpaid. We've talked about that over and over. But is he on the 18th hole? Um. It, it, that's a, it's a great question, and you know, and I'll let me let me own some things. You you hit it on the head when you said we knew he was on the back nine. Um, you know, anyone that's read our site for a while, um, you know, I, I don't want to back away from any comments when they signed Nick Swisher. You know, I thought it was fantastic. I thought it, just like you said, it was an overpay, but it was it was a pay to get better now, and you know, maybe you 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 eat it later. Um, later has come much quicker than I think we ever expected is, is the problem. So, you know, is he on the 18th hole? I hope not because if he is, and I, and unfortunately I think that's the reason you have to play him this year <laughs> is because if he's on the 18th hole, unfortunately you probably have to consider some serious changes to how this roster is built if you want to try to be a contender in 2015 and 2016 and still have Nick Swisher and his salary on it. And, and you have his salary on it. I mean, you yes. can, I guess you can debate based on how the rest of this year goes if you want him on the roster, but I'll tell you right now, the Indians are going to have him back next year. He doesn't have to get a hit for the rest of the season. He'll and make, like I was telling somebody in 2015, well, I've said this even off the air. I said, okay, let's say that he doesn't get any better here. I mean, not here's the other thing. People go, well, can you – because I said, well, if they trade him, you can take it to the bank that the Indians would have to eat a large portion of that, and they don't eat salary, man. Like, that's not happening. But even if they did, even if they said, you know what, get rid of half of his salary and we'll eat the other half – Somebody has to want him to trade for him, and I dare you to show me a franchise that's jumping up and down going, hey, I'll make you an offer on Nick Swisher. I tell people all the time when they toss trade ideas at me, if, if you think it's a good deal for the Indians, <laughs> look, at, look, at it, look at it from the other side of the mirror. You know, You just said if you could get a team to take half of his salary, 
look at it from the other side of the mirror. If we're talking right now and you told me that the Indians just traded for a hitter who's got two and a half years left on his deal and <laughs> is hitting a buck ninety, but the team they got him from is going to pay half of his fifteen million dollar salary for the next two years and you didn't have to give up anything, would you be happy? Would you be happy with that deal? No. We'd be talking about what's the point in this, you know? So so your own scenario that you rolled out, I mean, I, I get people all the time that say, well, they'll trade them, somebody will take them. No, they won't. No, they won't. There's not one team in baseball that 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 is currently in the, in the current situation. On July 1st, they're not taking him. Now, no, you're right. If he plays better in the second half and the Indians are willing to eat a mountain of salary, maybe, and you're still not getting anything for him. And, and the thing is, you're right, Jerry. You hit it right on the head. The Indians don't eat salary. And nope. if, if they're going to eat salary, you know, they're, they're going to stick with the guy on the flyer that maybe he turns it around because the only thing worse in their mind than eating salary is eating the salary while he's playing well for someone else. So I mean, that's, my, that's, that's where I go back to, you know, I think they have to play him in the second half to try and turn his, his season, his what's left of his career around. Because if that guy hits a hundred or one ninety for, for the season, I mean, I think we're going, you know, I think we're walking into November and unfortunately you're talking about some potential roster shakeup to try and make this team better um, and still carry Nick Swisher and because that's a reality. And, and so I, I think that's a road you got to go down in the short term to decide what you're going to do because I don't know – I don't know that you can afford to pay what I would – and I, I don't like using this term because it, it, it sounds derogatory, but it's not – spare parts. I don't know that you can afford to, to have spare parts or, I guess, um, good role players is probably better. I, I think of guys like, like David Murphy. You know, David Murphy's a good sign, but they're paying him five, six million dollars. You know, if Nick Swisher is going to hit 190 and soak up, you know, $15 million of your payroll, if you're going to go out and try and get, you know, another bat to help you, you probably can't afford someone like David Murphy for $6 million if you decide to roll with a Carlos Moncrief or Tyler Naquin or both in right field next year at the league minimum. Oh, and I and mean, that's, that's the you're... fact that. That's what happens, I guess, when you invest the money that they have and you don't get the results that you're supposed to. Because if he doesn't have a better second half, I mean, in all honesty, let's say he comes out of this season hitting 193, 200, whatever, you're paying $15 million next season for Jason Giambi, pretty much. You made that example a couple of weeks ago, and pretty much you're now paying for a very high-priced mascot. I mean, you might as well trot him out there with slider and have him do the seventh inning stretch because that's going to be what you're getting your money for. I mean, all all joking aside, he's now a $15 million Jason Giambi, except the difference is, well, no, yeah, Giambi at least won like seven or eight games for you. I mean, Swisher's got like two since he's been here, man. So I don't you're know, right. man. And, and I mean, roster-wise, they're essentially carrying two of them right now. Yeah. I mean, and that's why Giambi's, you know, living the 2014 season on the DL. And, you know, again, I don't, I think that Nick Swisher is the biggest letdown of the first half. I don't oh, no. think in any way this is not all his fault. But I also don't think it's an accident that they played really good baseball, maybe their best baseball of the year for the 15 days that he was not on the active roster when he was hurt. And he and Santana were both out of the lineup and had yeah. both been drastically struggling. That's the most production that they've seen from their lineup all season. Bro, and I don't last think it's night, an accident. Last night, my son, he's 15 and a half years old. We were watching that game last night and about halfway through, he said we were talking about, you know, Swisher. I was I was telling him what we were saying on the show yesterday or whatever and and he goes, "Weren't the Indians playing their best 
when him and Santana were down a couple weeks ago? And I said, yes. And that's so funny because you say the same thing. I mean, maybe it was timing. Maybe it was just the way it worked out. Or if you want to look at it the way we are, maybe it was the lineup that was there. But when those two guys went down, and again, it's I don't want to lump Santana in because I really look at him completely different. I mean, plus he's got himself, it appears, uh, back to normal a bit. But even during that slump, his ability to get on base made it negligible at least even though you you know you want more production but yeah you are exactly right look at how that was the one time this season that that offense has been humming and you go hell this is what this team can be at its best yeah and um i I know i've brought this up a couple times throughout the season but you know one thing that terry francona talked about last year all the time was just keep the line moving you know don't don't make an out, or if you make an out, you make a productive out and keep the line moving. Get get the next guy to the plate, you know, and, and try to create positive situations at the plate. And the thing is, you know, that is one thing that they don't have this year. They're not keeping the line moving. And with a guy like Nick Swisher, I mean, he's a line stopper. I mean, he yes. he he's he's killing them. And and in the same sense, when you bring up as Dribble Cabrera, one for thirty nine. Um, with runners in scoring position, you know that's that's a situation where the line is not moving with those guys. And I mean, I just think for the next four weeks, you know, you got to see our guys going to play better. And if if they get to you know July twentieth, twenty fifth, and they're still kind of stuck in neutral like they have been for the first eighty two games. I mean, I think you have to really, really ask yourself if they're better to, I don't want to say give up on this season, but uh. but look, you know, look towards 2015 and 2016 and, and what do you do that can, can try and shore your roster up for next season, you know, before the trade deadline. I can't be that guy. I can't. I'm not looking to next I, I season, think the, I think the worst part, Jerry, is, they don't have a ton of parts to sell. No, you're I mean, right. I've thought about, about you know, that. It's impossible to get. It's impossible to get rid of Nick Swisher. But I mean, if if you you know, I I hate being blow it up guy, and I'm not advocating for that. There's a difference between <laughs> you know maybe maybe trading as Dribble Cabrera, um, and, and I'm not sure that you can get a ton for him. But you know, there's a difference between trading him while his contract's about to expire. I guess kicking the tires on trading Justin Masterson, but I I would still be leery to do that at this point. I think it's I think with the season he's had, I, just a gut feeling. Don't be surprised if they get a deal done at the All Star break, and and if they don't, you know I'm not sure that the compensation pick that they would get by offering him the qualifying offer, you know, isn't better than maybe what they could bring back in a trade, but. If you decide to sell, other than as Drupal Cabrera, what else is there to sell? I mean, you're not trading Brantley. I don't think you're trading Chisholm Hall anymore. You're not trading Santana or Gomes or Kipnis. I mean, I guess I would entertain the idea of trading a Michael Bourne, but I don't see where a team where teams are going to be really excited to jump at him because of the salary that he carries. And he has had some ups and downs. I mean, he's, he's definitely not in the Nick Swisher category at this point, but it hasn't been all rainbows and puppies for the, for the Michael <laughs> Bourne experience either. Yeah, that's funny. You see, you and I are right here because that's one of the other things that Jerry and I were talking about during the game last night. And I said, well, you know, he's turned himself around a bit, you know, here. But, yeah, definitely he hasn't exactly made you jump up and down and go, you know, the off season of, of joy from last year just continues to spread the love. But he's he's definitely been better. But you're right. What you, Your main point is something I've been thinking about. I'm not even just talking about on the radio. I'm I'm going, man. Forget sports talk. Let's get real. What trades do you make? What, who? Okay, first off, who do you bring in? That's that's a hard enough thing. There is who's available and who's going to help you and who's willing to make trades. And then what do you send out when you take your top guys off the list? I mean, clearly we're not like you went through the major league guys, and obviously we're not in the market to move guys like Lindor or any of these top guys in the farm system. So. 
What what are you going to send out and what are you going to bring back in? And then you bring up Masterson and and even I've caught myself going, okay, well, you know, there may be a bit of a market for Masterson, but hell, we need pitching as it is. Why would we send pitching out to bring different pitching in? You know, it's almost like what do you bring in? But I there's no I, I still do believe, but I think I'm with you. I just believe that they will. I believe the team has to bring more out of themselves. But yeah, in if you're looking for just a savior in the trade market, I do believe, you know, maybe you can bring in something, but I don't know what. And I'm with you. Trying to figure that out is like, you know, it's not like you can just drop a trade. You know, people do the trade machine. They'll send me stuff like you said all the time. Oh, we could do this and that. I'm like, well, we could. But uh, when you turn your video game off and turn reality back on, that's probably not going to happen. So, you know, I challenge somebody to show me what we're going to move out and what other teams are looking to get from what we will get rid of. Now, if you say, hey, we're going to trade Lindor. Okay, well, now your trade market opens up, but nobody's doing that. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, you know, when you said the Indians don't have the, the prospects to trade, you're you're right. Um, if, if you don't include Francisco Lindor, they don't have the prospects to trade. And, you know, if if you're a guy that likes to make up trades, and I do, I would I would strongly encourage anyone. And I don't know if you saw this yesterday or not. Um, go to Deadspin, and they had ten months of leaked notes from the Houston Astros organization. Um, it's a story of someone obviously internally leaked this information, but it's this database that they created at some point early last season and it's notes of um, conversations between themselves and teams um, leading up to the trade deadline, um, what they were asking for and what teams were offering, um, and then notes from this past off season. And you should read it. And, I'm looking and at I it now. Say, wow. What's that? Man. I'm kind of just glancing. I looked it up while you were talking. I see what and, you're and the, saying the, here. The thing wow. is that blew me away. A couple things about it I thought, Jerry, were just amazing. First of all, you know, the first the, the stuff leading up to the tra- trade deadline is all about the Astros trying to trade Bud Norris. Um, and, you know, Bud Norris will never be compared to to uh, Pedro Martinez or Randy Johnson or any other really good pitchers because he's not. Um, He's a third or fourth starter. But to see the things that the Astros asked for all the way up to the deadline, you know, they asked the Orioles, who they eventually got a deal done with, you know, they were asking for Dylan Bundy and Kevin Gossman. That's they're two top pitching prospects, and I can tell you the Indians don't have a player like that in their system, much less two. They were asking for one or the other. Um, you know, they were asking the Red Sox for players like Xander Bogarts or um, Mookie Betts. These you know, the great. Indians don't have players like that. They have Francisco Lindor, and he is their one that is like that at this point. Um, so it, it makes it difficult. And, and in this wild card market where five teams get in and at the end of July, eight or nine think that they're in it, you know, the sellers are going to hold the cards. And, and, you know, what, what I got out of reading that is, is that, you know, you can ask, what teams do is ask for the moon and the stars and it only takes one team to yes. blink. And the thing with the Indians, you don't want to be that team as much as you want to win for all the things that we just talked about for a half hour and their inconsistencies, if you blink and you get that one player, I don't think it's fixing their problems. And, and you know, I if I had a time machine, you know, for all the times that they wouldn't trade Bartolo Colon or Jarrett Wright in the 90s to bring in Kurt Schilling or Randy Johnson or Roger Clemens, you know, I, I'd do it now because they were that close to winning, to winning it all. But this team's not, and and you can't in any way convince yourself of that. And so I would have a real, real, real hard time to part with Francisco Lindor to get to be good for now, especially at the price that it would take. 
I'm, you've got me thoroughly now interested in this as I'm look. How is this okay, by the way? How is this not a bigger deal that this in? I mean, this is a team's whole setup here with their internal data and conversations and all of this like oh yeah i mean and, this and is jeff amazing passen, yep and jeff passen from yahoo yesterday spoke to a number of officials from other teams um that are that are cited in there and off the record they they substantiated it i mean i and and the astros kind of addressed it yesterday afternoon no no one is denying it so let's put it that way there's there's, you know, maybe some some conversation, um, you know, to its exact wording and validity. But I, I think I think there's a whole lot more truth than there is fiction in there. I, I think what there's a couple things in there I thought were really interesting is that first of all, I mean, the Astros, who are still one of the one of the worst teams in baseball, they're out pursuing a trade for John Carlos Stanton last winter. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think that's amazing. Um, you know, the Marlins asked for, you know, George Springer and Carlos Correa and, and those talks quickly went in, into, uh, you know, into the garbage. But if I was a fan of either of those teams, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I mean, if I'm an Astros fan and I've been told to be patient forever. I'm not sure how I feel about, you know, trading for a guy that'll put people in the seats right now, but, you know, he might not be an Astro by the time they're ready to be, to be good. And if I'm a Marlins fan, I mean, I would be irate that the guy that they've promised me is is never going to leave. You know, they were, yeah. the door was open. <laughs> I mean, they, they they obviously quoted an asking price, so they didn't say no. He's off limits, which other mm-hmm. guys in that story did. I mean, this is amazing. The le- the fact that this could get leaked, plus the damage it does to other teams and their relationships with their players when word gets out. I mean, everybody knows it's a business, but there's a difference between saying it's a business and anybody can be traded and then hearing your name being discussed as being traded and all of that. It really, you know, affects different people in different ways. This is nuts. Absolutely. For those of you guys... Absolutely. That- I mean, there's, there's only one note on the Indians in the whole thing, and it's that um, it's it's in the off season. It's farther down, but Mike Chernoff makes a call, Indians assistant general manager to to the Astros, and they say that they're waiting for Ubaldo to decide on his qualifying offer. And if he does, they'll be financially strapped for the winner. So, I mean, in my mind, you know, do the math, and you can tell where the Indians' ceiling on payroll is immediately. It's right here. Is is you know no higher than ninety million, and the next sentence is that they have fielded calls on Carlos Santana. Yes, and, yes, I was just about you to know, uh, to say. It, let it, me read to that. To me, you know, if if he mentioned that in a phone call, it means you know the same thing as John Carlos Stanton. It means that the door was open, and and I know what the Indians will say, and and they're right. And, and you know, Mark Shapiro is one that has the line. He always says Babe Ruth was traded once. You right. know, anybody right. can be traded. And, and if, you know, you're going to give more value than what a player's worth, you know, we'll always listen. There are no untouchables. I've, I've heard him say that numerous times. And and so I know that that would be their answer. But just like you said, if, you know, with internal documents like that out there, you know, there's a lot of guys that are reading that today going, man, these guys talked about trading me last winter. Right, you know, across baseball. For, you guys have got to check this out. It's on Deadspin. The, the, what Mike was just talking about, I've got it right here. November 4th, 2013, they've got two notes. And it's interesting to see the Angels notes based on what they ended up doing. But it, the note says, and this is a direct uh, quote from what was written, Angels look to supplement their starting pitching and relief pitching, willing to deal from position player strength. Four players they would consider trading, Borjos, Trumbo, Ibar and Kendrick, of course, we know that they did end up making some trades. Then it says, spoke to Indians assistant general manager Mike Chernoff. If Ubaldo accepts qualifying offer, they will have no payroll flexibility and will stand pat. If Ubaldo declines, as they expect, they will be looking for a starting pitcher and in the outfield. They think their bullpen is fine. They have received calls on Carlos Santana. And that was on November 4th of last year, heading into the offseason. So that's the only note 
about the Indians, but it's just note after note about all the conversations that they had at the trade deadline and during the off season. Like when we go off the air, I'm just going to sit here and, and go through this for an hour, but uh, amazing that it can be leaked. And then all the stuff that's out there, but man, that's that. I mean, you got to think, doesn't that potentially violate some laws on top of just competitive, you know, uh, balance and all of that stuff. Like, I mean, isn't there some 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 law that you're violating when you put somebody? Oh yeah, there's confidentiality there. agreements. Yeah. I'm sure whoever yeah. the person that worked worked, and I say it past tense because well, you I know assume, they're going to find um, out. You know, there, there has to be a way. the Astros and leak that. You know, I mean, he's he's definitely uh, you know breaking some confidentiality agreements, and I would think if he could you know be proven as the person that leaked this information. Wow. Um, you know, I, I would think that there's criminal charges possible, but you know, but if they I, got, I think if they got the WikiLeaks guy, you got to think they're going to get the Astros leaks guy. You know what I mean? I like, would, I would think. You know, we we figured out Edward Snowden. You I know, mean, we should be able to figure out the Astros front office. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, but I, but wow. I think you know, talking about what we were beforehand, you know, the Indians and making trades. I think it's just fascinating to read that and see what the Astros were asking for and what teams were answering with. I mean, I I was stunned with some of the things that other teams said that they would consider giving up for Bud Norris. And, you know, just fast forward that to this year. You know, there's a lot of people that think David Price is going to be dealt. If the Astros were asking for that for Bud Norris, what do you think the Rays are fielding phone calls and asking for <laughs> for David Price right now? You know, and the same with the Cubs for Jeff Samarja. I mean, if, if the Indians if called for Price after, right now, if the Indians called for Price, they'd probably want uh, you know Lindor, Cabrera, and you know one of the other prospects too. You know, it's ah eh, throw in and maybe we'll think about it. You know, give us the phrase. At one kid. point we'll last winter, there was a rumor that they asked for Lindor, Santana, and Salazar. Well, there you go. That, that, that sounds like the kind of... I mean, clearly, look at the names we're talking about for lesser talent. I, I agree, but that's why I say, I mean, you have to read that, and if you if you think about it with a level head and apply it to the Indians, and you look at the way they've played their first half, I don't know how you could justify making a big move to try and win now. I mean, it's just, it's not realistic. All right, Mike, let's switch the conversation. We got to get to something positive here, man, because there's 81 games to go, man. There's a lot of time left in this season, man. A lot of time left. So you you. want to talk soccer? (laughs) No, but actually, uh, I did want to notice something. I wanted to ask you, because we've been talking about uh, over the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, just something we've brought up offhand, uh, which Indians perhaps end up as we head into July here all-star voting ends in a couple of days and uh, you know we talked about three kind of looking at Brantley smooth operator in the background play and Brantley and Kluber and Chisenhall and you know Jan Gomes as well as somebody who from his terrible start to the half has really picked it up and played himself defensively for somebody that committed so many errors I'm telling you man tell me that still the stuff we were talking about with him doesn't look true as far as just trying too hard to live up to that big contract at first because he's really picked it up. He's still nailing guys uh, near the top of the league and catching runners stealing. He's got his offense going a little bit here. He may have put himself in that conversation too. Do you think the Indians get four guys in the uh, All-Star game? I will walk to Minnesota if they get four guys in the All-Star game. (laughs) Do you I think mean, they get three? That's, that's Do you another, think they get three another of the one four? In a vacuum, you you can make the case for all those guys to be fair. Um, but you know, sit down with a piece of paper sometime and take take the voting and write down your all stars and then make your all star team. Fill out a thirty man roster. Don't use any pitchers that are going to pitch on Sunday before the all star break, and and take a player from each team in the American League that's deserving. And try get and try to fairly do it and see how many Indians you get. You'll have a tough time. Well, you're um, right because you mentioned I, Kluber. I think Michael Brantley's a lock. I think everybody after that's a question mark. Well, Kluber may be pitching that right before that, right? We talked about that before. That would eliminate him even if he's right. eligible, right? Right. Um, you know, so so we'll now, have to see can if they he still pitches be... on Sunday. 
and can they still be recognized? Um, you know, I don't always believe to. Um, there's, I don't, I don't want to say corruption or collusion, but there's certainly a good old boy network involved in selecting some of those last guys. And and to be honest, it probably works in the Indians' favor this year as John Farrell makes the selection. Right who's a good friend with Terry Francona, who's already asked Francona to be part of his staff. So if I'm wagering a number, um, I, I would bet on two. I think Brantley is a lock. I would be stunned if Brantley didn't make the all-star team. Um, I think he's a lock. And after that, right now, I would say Lonnie Chisenhall probably makes it. But I don't think that it's a guarantee. Interesting. I just man. don't know how I just don't know how you leave the the leader in the American League and hitting off off the All Star. Oh, team. absolutely, and I agree with you there, man. I think that one will be interesting too. Um, I might, I was just curious because I don't remember this off the top of my head. Those guys that aren't eligible because of their where their start comes in, they can still make the team and be recognized as a, as being selected, right? They just can't play. Yeah, I believe so. I, I think okay. that's the way that the Players Association agreed to it. Otherwise, that's what I you're thought. cutting into guys' bonuses. Yeah, oh, I mean, exactly, you, exactly. Yeah, you know, if you have an All Star game bonus in your contract, and your team sends you out to pitch on Sunday, they might save themselves fifty thousand dollars. So, don't you think? I think that's the way they agreed to it. Even leading the league in hitting, don't you think that the lack of kind of Production numbers, power numbers. Does that does that neg does that take down a little bit Lonnie Chisenhall's first half in people's eyes? I think his inexperience in in, in the whole process of selecting all stars, um, the fact that he's really had an up and down two years, and then I mean I think it's easy to say, well, if he does it again next year, you know, then right. he's an all star. I think that hurts him more than anything. I mean, if he would have had a pretty good season last year and then a, a full-time starter and not still kind of riding the, the I-71 train back and forth. Um, you know, if he would have if he would have been the starter last year, you could really make the case that he's kind of emerging into his own. It's, you know, fair or unfair, it's easy to say, you know, that maybe this is just a fluke season. But I don't know how you, I don't know how you leave, the, leave the leader in the American League in hitting off the roster, so I'm with you. I feel I'm like you. I feel like they get two, and I guess he's their second one. But um, but I th- I think Brantley's a lock, and one of those other guys gets on. And I if any of them were left off, it won't surprise me. I want to see you walk to Minnesota, man. I'm gonna have to try to rig the balloting here or something, man, because I just want I just want to see how nice to walk town to in the summer. It's kind of a breeze, <laughs> so you know I'm, Mike, I'm really into I'm really into health and fitness. I'm I've lost 60 pounds since the first three years, so a quick walk to Minnesota wouldn't be so bad, I guess. Man, I'm right there with you. I'm at 30 myself, man. Way to go, brother. All right, man. Wow, that's good to hear, man. I didn't even know that. Good. Congratulations. Good for you, man. That's awesome. I took, I took up running on, on the first of the year, and I long, long story short, but I need I need some competition in my life, and I can I can compete with myself. I was a, I was a high school baseball coach for a long time, and and I gave that up a couple years ago, and, and when I did, you know, the competitive juices are there, but I guess I didn't really have any way to, to get them out. So uh, I kind of decided I was going to lose some weight at the first of the year, and I was going to start running, and uh, I've got my 5K time down. Uh, my next goal, uh, my next race is July 12th, and uh, my goal is to get in in under 24 minutes. So, so I, I've definitely got the competition in me going again. That's good to hear, my man. I'm uh, I'm competing a little bit. Ah, well, I'll talk more about that later. I got some things coming down the road, but yeah, man, that's a uh, that's awesome, my man. Hey, last thing tonight, Indians. It looks like hey, if Justin Masterson, if if the good Justin Masterson shows up, we could have a fourth straight uh, good pitching battle going on here. Masterson and Josh Beckett going at it tonight. Yeah, I mean, it could be another good pitching matchup. I, we started to talk about that, you know, as bad as the Indians offense has been, you know, their pitching has been pretty good and has really held them in, um, you know, both games that they've been one hit. They've had a chance to win into the late innings. And, you know, like you said, if the good Justin Masterson shows up, they may have another one of those chances again tonight. 
Absolutely. Interesting to see. 10-10. First pitch for that one. Masterson and Beckett. You know what? Actually, I didn't even think about this. You were going to come back on Thursday. We're doing a three-day week this week, so I'm not going to talk to you again until next week. So, man, uh, enjoy your holiday. I don't know if you've got anything planned here coming up this weekend, but uh, anything going on with the Brandenberry clan? Uh, going I'm, to check out some Tribe I'm, games? I'm starting the Brandenberry PG, local PGA Tour opens tomorrow, <laughs> and I think I'll be golfing nearly every day, maybe maybe till we talk again next Monday or Tuesday. I think I have a tee time scheduled somewhere. Wednesday through Saturday, and if things cooperate, we'll we'll extend to Sunday and Monday as well. Get out there and get it in, baby, and go Indians as they wrap up the rest of this. They'll come home. They got a big stand. Got a lot of things coming up. You got the Fourth of July fireworks, the Fifth of July fireworks because. Yeah, what the hell? We got fireworks here. We might as well do it two days in a row. Got the Dobie jersey. You got the uh, the Kitness bobblehead. Yankees coming. Jeter. All of that stuff. A lot of things coming here in the next homestand for Indians fans. So uh, should be a lot of fun as we head into the holiday weekend and the month of July. Mike Brandenberry. You guys can check him out as always. Did the try win last night dot com and here on the Sports Fix. Mike, you enjoy your holiday and we will catch up next week, my man. You too. Take care. You too, Mike Brandenberry. Check him out on Twitter. Tweet with him at Did Tribe Win. We're going to take a break. When we come back, Dr. Football, the doctor's in the house. We're talking to Little Browns and looking at, as a matter of fact, he's already sent me his list here. Five or six things that he's looking for heading into camp here, looking to the season. Let's forget about the quarterbacks for a while and just talk about some football. Coming up next with Dr. Football here on the Sports Fix. <laughs> The Sports Fix, your choice for intelligent talk. I'm expecting a very important delivery at the house, so could you please call me if it arrives? I'll give you my cell number. 401-555-1125. Oh. 40. 4-4-0. No, no, I was just repeating the four. One four. One four. Yeah, intelligent talk. Okay, one one two five. One one two five. One five five. I'm not giving you quantities of the numbers. I'm giving you the numbers. One one two five. Those are the last four numbers. Oh, I see. One one two five. Yes. All right. Now read the number back to me. Let me get my pen. The sports fix will be right back. Guys, want to take just a second as we head into this break and remind you about the official business printing source of the Sports Fix, our friends at Signs and Ship. Signs and Ship, I'm telling you, Chris and Pam, they've taken care of me since day one, and they can do the same for you. Whether you're a small business that's already been established and you're looking to grow to that next level and expand your business, or perhaps you've got an idea that you just know is going to be a great business and you need to figure out how to brand it and how to promote it and put it out there, Signs and Ship is the place for you. If you need a logo, they can create one for you. They have a fantastic graphic designer. Business cards, signs, banners, yard signs, mobile advertising, anything you can think of that you need to promote your business, they've got it at Signs and Ship. The best thing about them, too, is each of their locations, whether it's the home base here in Elyria, Ohio that I work with, or their spots in Virginia, Florida, and Pennsylvania. It's all local sourced. Very important to me because we all understand that small business is the lifeblood of the community. So check them out, signsandship.com, or call Chris and Pam today, 440-323-6060, the home office in Elyria, Ohio. Signs and Ship, quality printing at affordable prices. Hi, this is Joe Tate, and you're listening to the Sports Fix. Whether it's an oil change or a new set of tires, Quick Lane at Valley Ford Truck has you covered for your automotive car care needs. They're your neighborhood quick service experts. They also offer a low price tire guarantee. Choose from 13 brands, and if you find the same tires at a lower price within 30 days, Quick Lane at Valley Ford will refund the difference. They're open late Monday through Thursday until 9 p.m. and open early Saturday so you can check it off your to-do list and get on with your day. They also have a newly remodeled service lounge and additional service bay just for Quick Lane oil changes. Quick Lane at Valley Ford Truck is located at 5715 Canal Road, right under the 480 Bridge in Valley View, just down the road from Independence. 5715 Canal Road, right under the 480 Bridge in Valley View, just down the road from Independence. Come see why life is better in the Quick Lane. Quicklane.com slash Valley Ford Truck. That's Quicklane.com slash Valley Ford Truck.
business owners and professionals, do you want to take your business, your product, your team, your event to the next level? You want to advertise right here with the Sports Fix. Our listeners are among the most loyal listeners, terrestrial or internet. The Sports Fix universe is not only the radio show, but tens of thousands of fans on Facebook and Twitter. Email me, Jerry Myers, the Sports Fix at AOL.com. That's the Sports Fix at AOL.com. And let me help you swing for the fences and hit it out of the park right here on the Sports Fix. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Harry Buffalo. Harry Buffalo, join the herd. News break. I'm Christine Lisi. Here's what's happening. Game day finally here for the U.S. men's national team. The Americans in the knockout round at consecutive World Cups for the first time, seeking their first quarterfinal appearance in a dozen years. The United States faces a Belgian team that won all three group games, gave up one goal total. ESPN soccer analyst Alexi Lawless. We're looking at a Belgian team that the U.S. shouldn't fear by any stretch of the imagination. This is not the U.S. coming up against a world power. Uh, certainly not with the, the talent that, that Belgium has, but I think in this instance right now, the U.S., I think, has become a much better team. Alexi Lawless on Mike and Mike. U.S. and Belgium, 3 Eastern on ESPN and ESPN Radio. Josie Altidore back for Team USA after missing two weeks for the strained hamstring. NBA Cavaliers agreed with guard Kyrie Irving on a max extension. Five years, $90 million. He can't sign it, though, until July 10th. NFL.com reports the league will prohibit the use of non-standard overbuilt face masks for the 2014 season. Research shows the non-standard masks more frequently fail safety and certification tests and aren't up to NFL safety standards. Brought to you by Mazda. Improve your road game. Mazda is the only automaker to have two sedans on this year's Car and Driver's 10 Best. The Mazda 3 and Mazda 6 combine the performance you want with the efficiency you need. You're listening to The Sports Fix. Welcome back to the Sports Fix live here on the Sports Fix, sportsfix.net and Spreaker and Mixler and TuneIn and the TuneIn radio app worldwide and of course on digital delay on iHeartRadio, the world's largest internet radio provider on iTunes and Stitcher Radio, SoundCloud, podcast formats, CarPlay, you name it, we're on it and you're listening to it. Thank you guys so much as we roll on our two and extended Indians conversation with my man Mike Brandenberry from did the try win last night.com. Thanks to Mike for joining us here. Thank you guys for being with us. We still got the phone lines closed, but you can hit us on the social media, Facebook.com slash the sports fix. Tweet with us at the sports fix C L E. In just a minute, going to the phone lines, going to bring my man, Dr. Football on here. He's with us every Tuesday, but I just, I literally almost did a spit take with my coffee here. Just the headline popped up on my, one of my alerts. Pacers produced a movie to make free agent pitch to Lance Stevenson. And I just laughed because I got, the first thought in my head was, uh, uh, that doesn't always work out so well, Pacer. I don't know. That might not be the way to go. Didn't the Cavs, what was it? Cause that's what I was thinking of. Didn't they, uh. His uh, LeBron, what did they make? A Family Guy, a, a Family Guy cartoon or something? Because that was like his favorite, uh, his favorite television show or something. Which speaks, by the way. But anyways, uh, uh, yeah, I just I laughed at that. I I said, well, I mean, you can always make a video, you know. I dare you. We are Lance Stevenson, and then have a guy blowing in it. Like I could be like instead of whistling, he could be like, <laughs> and it could be like you could make a chorus of it. But anyways. Uh, I got a kick out of that. Welcome back in. Going to talk some football here with my man, Dr. Football. And we are going to talk some football. I'm tired of nobody's in trouble right now. I'm not talking pensions. And we are not talking about quarterbacks. That's my rule here for this segment is uh, I don't care who the quarterback is. We're going to just assume that somebody with a functional right or left arm is going to deliver the football to the players and snap the ball. Let's just assume that there's a player 
on the on the uh, field that will be handling the quarterback position because what we're going to talk about is just in general. Matter of fact, it's funny because the doc sent me his list of things and it's kind of I kind of had one too and we're pretty much on the same page here. Uh, but we're going to look at five or six things, questions to look for about the actual Cleveland Browns as they get ready to head into camp here. So let's go to the phone lines. Talk to my man, Doctor Football Bill. How you doing this afternoon? I'm doing very good, Jerry. How about yourself? I'm doing well, as always, and I'm even better now because you're here. We're talking some football, so life is good, man. Heading into the holiday weekend, life is good. Yes, it is. That's it? That's it. Yes, it is. All right, that's good enough. No, I thought you no, were gonna, I, was, gonna, I thought you were going to expound. Re- no, I, hey, man, hit it. That's it's cool, special man. Day. It, it's a special day <laughs> to me because uh, this is the 13th anniversary of my first date with my now wife. So That's you know, what I was I waiting like, for. I always like to remember July 1st. That's what I was waiting for. You 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 sent me a text and told me it was the special occasion for you and I said it I said bam here we-. hopefully she's not listening right now man. We're just going to pretend that uh, that didn't happen and that was the very first away. thing she's you said. She's a couple rooms away. She could probably hear my end of the conversation but um we do we do listen sometimes after the fact. So, no, that's pretty know. cool man. All all joking aside, that's pretty cool. Congratulations to you guys. Hopefully you have something Thank something you. fun planned to commemorate the day. Yeah, we're just going to go to lunch because uh, there are no good concerts around here right now, so we can't do that. Uh, you know, the only good stuff going on here music-wise is on the weekends, or you have to go down to Phoenix or to Vegas. So, you know, we'll, uh, you know, we'll address that at another time, but uh, yeah, we're going to have a good day. Uh, it always helps when you've got a few extra dollars in your pocket from getting paid to do that. So, we'll we'll, uh, we'll Go to a sit-down lunch instead of a takeout lunch, if you know what I mean. Upgrading for the uh, for the woman of, of the hour. There you go, Doctor Football, my man. Well, congratulations to you guys. I hope you uh, hope you enjoy the Thank day you. for sure. You ready to talk some football, Doctor Football? You know it. You know it. You know it. And I think the the first question, and you and I both uh, agree on this one, is how hard will they really work in camp, and at what point does it get serious? You know, uh, which you know, when do the Cleveland Browns show up at camp? That's really the key here. And for me, you know, it has to be if not exactly on the first day on on reporting day, it has to be you know that first practice without pads. You know, you got to you got to see some crisps, some, some crispness in the routes, and uh, you know, you don't have to be you don't have to be game ready. You know, first game of the season ready on day one, but you have to show some desire to be there. Absolutely. That kind of actually what you're saying there really kind of ties into one of my main things, which is before you even get to the players, Mike Pettin, a rookie head coach. How is he going to handle all of camp, including not just having a regular camp, but obviously you're going to have added eyes because one of the quarterbacks may potentially be interesting to the media. So you're going to have added all of that stuff, but how is he going to run his camp from day one? Because one of the things that the Browns have stressed is that for the first time in years, they say, there's going to be a true spirit of competition. And I can feel internally that they are are very serious about that at all positions. So I think the tone is set from day one. If it's not, then that'll be very telling right there. But uh, I do expect, and I'm curious too, because a lot of us have seen, and I, I was going to say just the media, but it's the fans too, because the Browns have the open training camp sessions, is we've seen becoming experts at seeing how regimes run training camps here because we've seen so many different ones in the last 10 or 15 years. <clears throat> going to be interesting to see the tenor that the Browns set from the beginning because that is going to be... Uh, that's the key because we've I've seen the training camps where they come out with a more veteran approach to it, which really bothers me for a team that more years than not has come off of a bad season. I've always thought, man, that that is what you do when you're the, the defending champions, when you're a consistent playoff team, when you've got a veteran team. I I'd have not understood why young Browns rosters have been coddled by certain training camps and so i want to see and i think it will because and say you know this could be a detriment in the season the whole high school coaching level and that whole real rah-rah aspect of mike Pettin. but i do think that his roots are in the the 
the dog days of the summer and getting a team ready all the way back to high school. So I think that one place he may do well is training camp. And then maybe maybe the regular season, you know, who knows, because that's a different animal. But I'm, I agree with you. The tone that they set in training camp is going to be the key to the whole thing from day one. Are they aggressive? And that's why he's my number six. Why is, is he the right guy to lead this team? And that's very, very important because, uh, you know, he, he, he is a training camp guy. And that's one thing that Rex Ryan said about him, complimented him after he got the job. Uh, it was here, uh, you, you know, well, not here, but that was going on uh, with my New York folks, was that he is camp for the Jets, who organized things on the defensive side of the ball, who organized the drills, and who made sure that helmets popped and pads popped, you know, when they went, uh, you know, with full practice equipment. Of course, that's cut down uh, these days within the CBA. Yeah. But... Uh, it's important to show that snap when you're when you're in equipment, even even shells. You, you have to show a, a you know you have to show some some. Uh, we used to call it in the in the army esprit de corps. You know, show us that you want to be there. Show us that you belong to be there. Show show us that you have a reason for being. And I agree with you there too. And I think uh, you know what Barney was saying. That's a going to be interesting with the mix of guys some of the guys that they're bringing into camp is uh i was jokingly telling some friends i said man and, and earl bennett was one actually that i used as an example a couple of weeks ago except they jumped the gun on me and they cut him early i said some of these guys i wouldn't be surprised right. if they signed a couple of these quote unquote i don't want to say big bigger name but they are i guess bigger names than just the unknown uh undrafted type of guys i said i wouldn't be surprised talking to a couple of my buddies the, uh, a couple of weeks ago if a few of those guys aren't example setters as in they're there to get cut to show guys hey it doesn't matter what your name is it doesn't matter how long you've been in the league we'll cut you we'll we're, we're looking for the best players and i specifically pointed at guys like him i said hey i could see that being a guy that they say hey maybe we get lucky maybe not but it also shows people that you know it doesn't matter how you got here we're going to take the best 53 whether you really are or not what people what the players believe is important and sometimes you've got to make an example out of a guy or two so i kind of thought fairly or unfairly a couple of those guys may be sacrificial lambs for that very purpose to kind of set the tone and make an example you know and and teams not in a bad do that. Way, there are some know? teams that do that sometimes you know i mean there, i yeah. don't know if there's anything really wrong with it uh i may want to keep a guy around you know a little longer you know a veteran guy for example nate burleson Absolutely, and your good segue because the next thing on my list is wide receivers. And what's stupid about the Browns doing the same thing year after year is is shown in the wide receiver position because every single year it seems that we're talking about the Browns' lack of wide receivers, not even having a one most years, or once they finally do have one, not having a two or a three or anything else as we've seen even up to last year. Here you sit this year, and I'm just going to, we're just going to forget Josh Gordon. He's not a part of the equation here. Looking at the wide receivers, who is going to emerge from this group? Because I think you've got an interesting group. I don't know how effective but I think you've got an interesting group because you've got the veteran half of the wide receiver group, which is, you know, guys like, you know, obviously Miles Austin and and uh, and even uh, Alexander as well, who I think don't sleep on him just because of his familiarity with Shanahan in that offense. Right. And I think Shanahan likes right. him. But Hawkins, too. I think the Browns have plans for him, regardless of what he ends up doing. I think the Browns are going to figure him in. Then Miles Austin, maybe he makes the team, maybe he doesn't. I'm really not sure. But then you've got the un that group of kind of unheralded, undrafted guys. Charles Johnson, who a lot of people have been intrigued with since they snagged him from the uh, – Packers late last season, and you've got a couple of the right. other guys, these undrafted guys from this draft. I'm very interested to see what the final mix of wide receivers is, because if there was one position that you could truly come to this year, if you're an NFL player looking for an opportunity, it's wide receiver on the Browns. It's right there for any of them to take. Any of them could end up being one, two, three. You know what I mean? So I think that is just a wide open opportunity if those guys get it. And if they don't, 
will the Browns look elsewhere? I'm very curious to see how wide receiver shakes out. Yeah, that, that's also one of my keys. Uh, a little further down the list than you have it, but it's definitely a key. Uh, it, oh, I don't have them in a, order. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Football. I don't have them in order. I've just got five. That's fine. They're, that's yeah, fine. so we're just going that's all over fine. with that. You know what's real that's, quick? As we're talking, cool, you, you, you're you on the Twitter, too. As we're talking about the wide receivers and Andrew Hawkins, Andrew Hawkins just favorited my tweet about it. I'm like, well, there you go. His ears must be ringing right now. But uh, anyways, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, th- that's very important because this is a group that electrifies the team. Without production from the receivers, the Browns are a ho-hum team. Oh, With God, receivers... Yeah. Snapping the routes and and being in position to catch the ball because we know that the receiver position is not old as much about speed as it is about how good your hands are and how well you run your routes. Yep. And that's really, really important. And I think this is a good group of route runners more than anything else. And you know what? The ones that aren't, like you said, they'll be shown the door pretty quick because in Shanahan's system, you have to be able to get to spot X to catch ball Y. Talk to me. I, I mentioned Miles Austin. I said I'm not 100% sold that he makes this team. What do you think Miles Austin still has left in the tank? You you know, you've seen what he did with Dallas, you know. I mean, is there still something left or is he is his best role served as just being a a veteran wide receiver to teach the young guys or is there still some gas left in that tank? Well, it's a combination of both. There is still some gas stuff in the tank. Do you want the guy on the field on every play? No, he's not your number one or your number two. Uh, he's a veteran number three that you bring in for three wide sets. Uh, he's a guy that can still scare people because he has a good uh, step, first couple of steps off the snap. You know, inside the first couple of yards, you know, I guess he slows down a little bit beyond 10 yards, but if you need a guy for a short catch, and look for some, you know, you look for somebody to turn that short catch into some yard, some yak, some yards after catch. Then he's your guy. You think real quick because I saw Vashon mention his name in the chat room. I, we talked a little bit when they did it. Do you think the Browns reacted? I mean, some people say they waited too long. Do you think they went too long, too early, or or should they have held tight? Greg Little letting him go the way that they did. Um, again, some people say, hey, more power to him and. Uh, I'm just a guy that was kind of in the belief that he was getting I really do believe he was he was coming around, man. I've again I've watched him work after practice. I watched his training, his work ethic, and uh and the fact that he was a converted running back to wide receiver, I thought set hit I mean that instantly I thought was a year that you should take off of his development just because of the switch. I really felt like he may have had a decent season this year. I'll tell you. Uh, I noticed doing my research for the draft, I think I brought this up, that uh, there was a a stat that I came across that showed uh, when people were looking for the Browns to draft wide receivers in the second and third round, that the average second and third round wide receiver last year drafted uh, averaged less of production than what Greg Little ended up doing for the Browns last year. And I really thought that he could have been, you talk about veterans. I mean, even though he seems like a younger guy, he's been around for a minute. I thought maybe going one more year with Greg Little wouldn't have been too bad, but sometimes it's better, you know, to cut ties when there's bad feelings and there's just, it's better to get a fresh start. Maybe the Browns felt that way, but I would have went one more training camp with Greg Little unless they were convinced that he wasn't in their plans, and then they were being fair by giving him the chance to go somewhere else. But I would have went one more training camp with Greg Little. What do you think? Yeah, I think so, too. Uh, I think it was strictly a numbers game, and that if it was up yeah. to them, they would have uh, they would have been able to keep him uh, if, if they didn't have to uh, be at a certain number uh, under, you know, at a certain date. And, you know, again, that just helps you get there quicker to that uh you know, that magic number. Uh, you know, the other thing with me is, like you said, if they're not going to, if he's not going to be in their plans at all, then you are being fair to him by having him come in and say, look, we're going to, we're going to let you go now and give you a separation bonus. This way you have a chance to catch on with another team or you can sit the year out and work out and, you know, wait for next year. But who knows if somebody gets hurt this first week of training camp and he's not signed, 
he's still out there, don't be surprised to see him back. Oh, no, he's a, he signed with the Raiders. He signed with the Raiders right Oh, he did sign with the Raiders. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I know the it Raiders were talking to him, but I hadn't heard of him. Yeah, no, he's with, not. yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if he makes the Raiders. I thought that's what was funny is right after he signed, he tweeted and circled. The date is circled on the calendar, the Browns and the Raiders game. I'm like, bro, you got to make the squad first. But I think he will because they're pretty uh, – it's not like the uh, the talent is abundant out there uh, in Raider land. But uh, anyways, uh, you know, I would have went another season with him. But I can see why, too. I know a lot of people frustrations with the drops. And, and really, I get that. Like, I, I get it because you got to, like you said, it's one thing to know how fast your receiver can run or how far or what his home run potential is. But the one thing you've got to know, not just be pretty sure of, is that he was going to catch the ball. So, right. uh, and and that's it. And so from that aspect, I can't complain, but uh, you know, anyway, so that's what's done. What's the, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about? Let's talk defensively a little bit because once again, a new scheme, a new coach, although not a complete overhaul from what they had before. Let's be real. I mean, you know, obviously, and Browns fans love to do it, and I don't blame them because the whole dog thing is about defense, and that's kind of, you know, always a thing. But, you know, it's one thing to look. Last year, so many people said, man, this defense is going to do this, it's going to do that. And and it did it did live up to the hype a little. Not not live up to the hype, but it played well early. Obviously, as holes and leaks and everything started springing, then the depth started to show and it just t- fell apart. But, you know, it was never the attacking that it was, although it, was, uh, it wasn't as porous as years past. Here you go again, realistically. How good do you think the Browns can be defensively? Because I think wherever you think they're at offensively, the one place that they will be able to hang with any team in football this year is on the defensive side of the ball. Not just the scheme, not just the coaching staff, but I really do like the young, just the young talent they've got that they drafted over the last few years. That's a lot of young, fast athletes, and I think that they're going to get after the quarterback. I just don't know. If they, I think they've they've done a good job of improving the defensive backfield. That's going to be every bit as important. But I do believe that the defense is going to carry this team this year. Yeah, and you brought up the main point because uh, the defense is going to be very important in in the scheme. And you know, I say it really hinges on how well Joe Hayden plays. Yeah. And again, that's why I said how good is Joe Hayden that I put in parentheses really. You know, and it's very important because he's he's as young as he is, he's going to be one of the leaders on that unit. He already is. Right, you know, and now for the first time in a while, you you know, you really I mean, for so long it's been, you know, Joe Hayden and then who else? And who's your number two guy? And I think now you're, you've at least given, you know, given the guy. Uh, of course, Gilbert has to win the job. It's assumed that he will. And, you know, is he the guy to handle the other side of the field? And then once Joe Hayden has that now, like you said, is he able to live up to the expectations and the hype? Because I do believe, I do believe Joe Hayden's very good. Some people I think are too critical on him, but sometimes I feel that some people are too easy on him too. I do believe that he's very good. I also believe you cannot fairly judge him until you've got other defenders back there handling their job. But, you know, I don't know. You see, so many people throw that word locked down like he's just a straight man, locked down guy. But I do believe he's got some of those tendencies, but it's it, it different. But I do believe he can be a number one. And I think this will give him a chance here to see with somebody opposite him, assuming that Gilbert wins the other job. You know, and that's important because he, he is a very good, quote-unquote, lockdown. He's a good man coverage corner, but he can do so many other things. You know, right. he's a threat going the other way uh, on interceptions. You know, he's a threat to make it a pick six, take it to the house. And as long as you have a guy like that roaming around back there with his foot speed and his ability to cut like a running back, he's a running back and a defensive back's number to me, and that's what a defensive back is supposed to be back there, somebody who can not only defend the opposing receiver, but when he gets the ball in his hands, becomes a threat. And I'll tell you what, man, some people, you know, like I just brought up, have different opinions of Joe Hayden and and what level they think he's at. The uh, 
criticism anyway, good and bad and fair and unfair, will obviously go to another level with him this year with the money and the contract and all of that. Because now, I mean, now the focus is 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 now go out there and continue to prove that you are what you say you are, which is right there at the top of the league. And so, and I do like the depth that they've built in. They've added some guys, uh, and not just talking corners, defensive backs in general. I, I like the guys that have been emerging, the bad emotions, you know what I mean? Tayshawn Gibson, I think they've found, they've uncovered a couple of guys that can be good role players and maybe even uh, better than that, maybe even starters back there. You added, we know, Dante Whitner, and then cornerback. You added Desir. You added several young cornerbacks. You had Buster Screen, who I think once Gilbert, uh, if he takes, as we expect, that number two cornerback spot, then you can really capitalize, uh, assuming that he can hold off Pierre Desir uh, on Buster Screen and what he's strongest at, which is covering those slot receivers. Yeah, and that's very important because when you cover the when you cover the deep guys and you lock the deep guys down, the offense adjusts and they go to the slots, the slants, and the short curlings. And then when that happens, you have to be able to have the other guys who could move up. You have to be able to have a good free safety and a good strong safety who can move up and jam those guys in the box so they're, they're not open on every play because you're covering the deep guys. I'm with you in the chat room, Vashon, about Tayshawn Gibson, too. He's continuing to emerge, you know. So, and, and you know, it's, it, it, it bugs me sometimes when I look at the Browns and how they, because, it, you know, here there's a few guys that they were actually, you know, developing that you didn't hear hear about, and the Browns found them and dug them out, but then got so many of the bigger decisions wrong over the years. And bam, uh, in the chat room, I just saw it. Do not. I don't know if he's going to beat out Gilbert. That was the the comment that was just there. But Pierre Desir, do not sleep on him at at some point making some noise at least in that starting wide receiver conversation, whether it's out of camp or whether it's throughout the season. I'm not saying that he wins the job, that he straight beats out Gilbert. That's what Vashon said in the chat room. But Pierre Desir, I think, is going to open a lot of eyes. I think he could be... You know, one of the one of the uh, one of the good unsung draft picks the Browns have made in the last few years. And I think uh, with him, because he's so versatile, they'll find a way to keep him, even if he doesn't make a starting position. You know, oh, he'll yeah. be in the rotation. No doubt, he'll okay. be he'll be and, in and, that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we talked about yeah, that. That's important. the one thing is people grew up on the era of our of back in the day when you needed two cornerbacks and two safeties and that was and everybody else was their backups and they were the the second tier not anymore in today's three four five receiver constant offensive sets you need three four and five starting cornerbacks not two starting corner because i mean how many people grew up with the traditional cornerback one cornerback two safety one free safety strong safety those are your four guys everybody else's backups now you literally need four or five starting level cornerbacks to be able to cover those wide receiver sets so people look at that the wrong way and go man we're good we've got two cornerbacks now we need four or five so we need all of these guys screen gilbert all of them to steer everybody's got to contribute for this defense but it is uh, deeper this defensive backfield i do believe is the first really decent one the browns have put together in a while yeah i agree and uh i think it's very important because you're going to see guys uh you're going to see guys doing things to the Browns that they haven't done in a couple of years. You're, you're, you know, with Shanahan in there, uh, you're, it, it's going to be a new ball game. And, and that's really important. The energy that the offensive coaching staff, especially Shanahan, will bring to the sideline, to the locker room, to the meeting rooms. Uh, you know, this is a, this is a group of coaches that, uh, you know, we talked about this, Jerry. I applaud them for going out and getting the guys they did behind this guy because, you know, a head coach cannot do all the work himself, all right? And we obviously know Pettin's a defensive guy, so, you know, Shanahan's going to be the offensive guru here. He's got the offense, and, you know, he broke away a little bit from his dad. You know, he, he started to get a little bit of his own identity, uh, you know, with the Redskins, and you're going to see, you know, some of that now flourish because he's not working with daddy anymore, and he's, he's sort of going to be on his own. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested to see the offense that he puts together. I mean, clearly we know 
basically the Shanahan offense. I'm sure there will be some tweaks. And then obviously, you know, we didn't talk about the quarterbacks today because I'm just tired of talking about the quarterbacks with the Browns right now. But okay. uh, obviously, right. well, no, because obviously that's going to be, you know, a question all of its own. And that's one that we talk about every single day at some point the word Manziel or Hoyer gets brought out somewhere but uh, I'm I mean when that question gets decided then I want to I'm curious since we're talking Shanahan in seeing how he incorporates assuming uh that Brian Hoyer starts the season uh, how he incorporates Manziel cuz I expect there to be uh I do expect him to play some regular season I think they put a package together. Hopefully it won't be as obvious as the old traditional Josh Cribbs flash package, which used to drive me nuts because the only time they'd bring it in, you knew exactly what they were going to do. It's like, it wasn't even an effective uh, decoy play, but uh, anyways, uh, it'll be curious to see. You can't do that. You've got to develop a set of plays for him. If you do that, because uh, uh, obviously you don't want people to know, well, when he comes in the game, they're going to run the option. You want it to be a, a full spread. But, you know, that's that's another question. I want to see how he handles the offense because I do believe that, you know, last year Chud may have been the head coach, Norv may have been the offensive coordinator, but you're talking two offensive guys. We're now back to the other side where we've got the defensive head coach putting his offense in the hands of a coordinator and really being hands-off. He'll be much more hands-on with the defense. So Shanahan's going to be key. He's really going to be key to this offense, and that can be good or bad. Listen, there's a lot of good that I, I've seen over the years, but there's bad about Shanahan too, and, I, and I, he's got the opportunity to continue to make a name for himself outside of the family shadow. So that's going to go a long way too into seeing what the uh, what the Browns do. Outside of the things that we've talked about, is there anything we've left out that you've got circled as this is going to go a long way towards determining the Browns' season in training camp? Well, you know, I have I have at my number three, you know, how how will Ben Tate impact the offense and when do the writers stop following Johnny Manziel to the end and realize that Tate is there also? And, you know, <laughs> that's a little bit of a joke, but that's about, uh, you know, some of these ridiculous people that are just chasing the poor kid around. You know, give the kid a chance to breathe. You know, yeah, he's a hard partier, but, uh, you know, Paul Horning was a hard partier too. And how many championships did they win in Green Bay? I, I know it. that's true. It was a different era. You weren't even around, and I was a he little kid. He is most definitely. So, uh, I will say this: just to, my one Johnny football comment for today is it does become a little difficult to complain about the attention that you get when you continue to take pictures and post them every time you do something. He did it again. Everybody's talking about, ah, he took these pictures with Floyd Mayweather and Justin Bieber. And it's like, but two days ago, he's going, well, I wish the media would just stop talking about what I do. If you don't take that picture and post it on Instagram, nobody's talking about what you did yesterday. Like, you can say, oh, well, that's not fair. Johnny should be allowed to take pictures. But then you can't complain about what right. people say about him. Come on, man. Right. You yeah, love I know. the attention. I agree. Do and that, not, and, and, do and not and hang on real quick, what? Dr. Fall. Do not cry that you hate the attention and then seek the attention that is so right. that's that's what's ticking me off other than that the other stuff whatever but that drives me nuts don't say well i think you guys should just leave me alone and let us play football well then stop stop taunting the media right. Stop putting the pictures out there and making yourself the center of attention you goofball yeah, and I think, you know, I, I think he's doing this because that's what his generation is all about. That's what they're brought up on. Uh, and I had a conversation about this, uh, you know, with somebody here uh, a couple of weeks ago, you know, who also follows football very closely, doesn't do it like we do. But, uh, you know, he said to me, imagine if this guy would have came here as the back of Carson Palmer and how long, you know, when would Carson Palmer be on the next bus back? And I said, well, that's why it didn't happen because, you know, Bruce Arians isn't that kind of a coach. You know, Cleveland needs that kind of a player right now. Now, do they need him to go so overboard and, and be in Vegas every other weekend? I don't know. But, um, you know, again, that's what this generation does. They live their, they live their life on social media. Well, that's fine, but then you can't cry about people not leaving you alone and respecting your privacy, man. Like, right. 
You know, right. I mean, come on. Oh, I agree. I, I say the same thing about people that drive me nuts, like on Facebook and social media. They'll put every detail of their life out there and then get mad that people are all up in their business. And I'm like, man, the only reason I know that you got fired and the courts took your kids and your wife wants child support is because you put it on Facebook. If you didn't, <laughs> I would just think you were a Browns fan. But now I know yeah. that you're a bum, deadbeat dad that just, you know what I mean? Like, don't put your garbage yeah. on Facebook. And people won't know about it, man. So I make the same point there. But I just, it it trips me out that the kid will be like, man, I'm getting tired of it. I just wish people would leave me alone. I just want to be a normal person. And then he says, oh, by the way, here's me with Justin Bieber. I, you know, I mean, like, come on. I mean, anyways, but it's just my mentality is different. I, you know what? I'm in the wrestling business. A lot of these uh, young wrestlers that I'm around, every time they're in the same locker room with somebody that's a uh, former star, or some, they want to post it and say, oh, look, here's me with so-and-so. And it's like, man, I have probably got... Uh, I either personally wrestled them or met just about every superstar in the history of the wrestling. I've got my own personal collection of memories, stories, and pictures that I've never made public. Because to me, that comes across like name dropping. Like, listen, I don't need you to like right. me because I, I don't need you to like me because I do this and do that. I know what I do. And I don't need to put it out there. Like, I'm not brand. And, like, and, I, and it's like, dude, look, kid, you're rich. You're filthy, stinking rich. You got life by the by the short and curlies, man. Like, but when you bring, I just believe he brings his own problems onto himself half the time. And life could be, I think so many people do that. Life could just be easier if people would let life be easier. But sometimes they just can't. It has to be difficult. Life is not fun if it's not difficult for some people. And I just think he's one of those people. A drama queen. Who may be very good at football, but is definitely one of that generation, in my opinion. Well, until we see him wearing a dress, we can't call him a drama queen. We've got to call him a drama prince. <laughs> you know what I mean. Come on. Man. I know. And and you know I what? Know. His, his choice of friends also happen to be drama queens doesn't exactly... Uh, see, you're already setting... You see, you're already setting yourself up for failure, kid. But hey... As long as you can sling that football, let's see what happens there in training camp, man. Uh, but you know what? Seriously, Dr. Football, a couple more weeks here. Uh, we got 4th of July coming up here. We got party weekend here. Everybody get to uh, blow off some steam. I'm sure players are as well. Coaches everywhere with their fingers crossed that nobody uh, gets themselves in too much of a situation before we get to camp. But I'm fired up, getting close to football. Oh, by the way, last thing I wanted to ask you here. Somebody sent me a message, Bruce on on our uh, Facebook. He sent me a message and said he had heard something yesterday that the 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 uh, NFL was going to announce Josh Gordon's suspension on the 26th of July, which is the kickoff of training camp, which seemed like an odd date to wait for. Did you hear anything about that yet? I couldn't find it anywhere, but he said he heard it in an offhanded comment on one of those uh, ESPN shows. I I didn't see it, so I don't know. Have you heard anything about an official date that they're going to make this announcement? No, not an official yeah, date. Okay. Just just uh, more in the end of the month than the beginning of the month. Okay, uh, I'm just curious. They, I've looked they, everywhere it, and I can't find it, and right. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I looked also because I I, uh, I heard the same thing that uh, uh, he's talking about, uh, and it was on uh, NFL Network that I heard it. It wasn't on ESPN, uh, and you know my instantly I you know I messaged the person who said it. Uh, because I was watching a rebroadcast late at night, and uh, the next day in the morning, I heard, and they said, "Bro, that's just stuff they give me for filler that I, they want me to say." You know, he <laughs> says, we, we, that's why we said it's a rumor. We don't have it confirmed yet, and, oh, you, and, you, know, you won't that. get that. You won't get that out of 280 Park Avenue. The only thing you'll get from 280 Park Avenue is that they're they haven't decided yet <laughs> where they're moving the draft to next year. Just that they're moving it out of New York City for a couple of years. Oh, man. You just reminded me of a story I want to tell in the final segment. Dr. Football, Bill Check is my man. He's with me every Tuesday as we talk NFL. We talk Browns here. Looking ahead to training camp, which is coming just around the corner at the end of the month. Bill, my man, enjoy Independence Day, your holiday, and I look forward to catching up with you next week about whatever else is up and going on, man. Yeah, and I'll leave you with this one last thing because I always like to leave uh, you know all of our listeners with something very special. Uh, this to me is something very special that the league is probably doing right. 
Uh, they are uh, in talks with the uh, Zenith helmets to bring in the X1 helmet uh, and make the X1 helmet the official helmet of the NFL uh, because of the concussion injuries. And uh, for the people that don't know, the Zenith X1 helmet is uh, something that was created by a former college football player. Vin Ferrara is a former quarterback for, for Harvard, and uh, he became an MD and a neurosurgeon, and uh, he invented this helmet to reduce injuries and for better or for worse this is a particular helmet that uh, Deion Sanders happens to also endorse for uh, youth football and high school football so uh, you know we're hoping that that comes through and that uh, the helmets get a little more protection in them because uh, you know the only issue here is this helmet is like twice the price of a Riddell well hey you know what in a league that it makes record setting billion dollar profits I'm pretty sure I'm not in the slightest bit worried if they have to spend double on the helmet to protect some of the players so let's I hope that that's the last time I hear that used as a reason why they don't want to talk about it because a league that makes that much money cannot complain about the cost of a safer helmet yeah, I mean, what they've done is they've usually left it up to the teams, but now with everything that's been going on in the past few years, you know, the league's going to take back some, uh, you know, officiality with that. And I think it's good. I think it's a good change. Come on. The Browns have got Felix Wright, who sits at, at the end of the sideline by the NFL, and his job is to make sure that the players have the right number of stripes on their socks and that they're towel is tucked in and on the right side so that they get fine and you can make sure about that but we're gonna we're not gonna make sure that they're using the safest equipment possible as they bash their brains in at 100 miles an hour and uh, and great comment in the chat room too um and now this is where and i'll tell you what i'll go back to the nfl with their billions of dollars because you know that's great for the nfl level but how about protective helmets at the high school the peewee the college level etc you know uh i i gotta tell you that, that that's something the nfl could look into too protecting the future but it's easy for me to spend somebody else's money you know so uh but i'll tell you what man uh that's a, that's a good piece of information too hopefully they do go forward with that you hear the same thing with baseball even though they're not going to uh you know, they kind of leave that up to people's discretion whether they're going to use it or not. I say the hell with that. I say make it, just make it. It's just like a seatbelt. For a long time, seatbelts were left up to people's discretion. And then they said, you know what? We're just going to make you wear a seatbelt. And, and we'll pull you over if you're not wearing one. And look at how many more people wear seatbelts now. And they're safer. So, you know, sometimes you right. just have to force it. You have to. And, and it's like, it's like you, you know, you... You say you want people to wear a seatbelt, but then, you know, you make motorcycle helmets optional. Oh, I know. Okay. The Trust you, me, I know. I, I, yeah. I see people... I, I just, I shake my head. I, I have friends that ride. You know, I don't ride anymore, but I have friends that ride, and I say, where's your helmet, dude? And they're like, yo, we don't need one here. It's Arizona. And I'm like, dude, when you hit an act, when you hit a pothole and you go flying, you, you're going to need that helmet. We don't Otherwise, need one here in Arizona. Be scrambled you know. We don't need one in Arizona where the cement is not as hard as it is everywhere else, you know, where you can still not right. get your brain scrambled. Oh, come on, man. Right. Dr. Right. Football, my man. Hey, always a great time talking to you. I look forward to next week, my man. All right. I'll talk to you next week. Have a very good holiday. Be safe. Be sound. And everybody, football's coming. Absolutely. And he's the doctor. Dr. Football, Bill Checkers. You have a good one. We'll catch up next Tuesday. You guys sit tight. When we come back, we're wrapping things up. I'll tell you a funny story yesterday about the uh, the Kyrie Irving as, around the time that uh, uh, some of those reports were breaking. I got into it with one of those guys from the uh, from the plane dealer. D-Man, hey, he set me straight on Twitter. <laughs> we'll talk about that. We'll set the stage for the Indians tonight. Go USA and more. Don't go anywhere. One more segment of the Sports Fix to come. Warning. Listening to the Sports Fix could cause serious injury, bodily harm, or even death. Ah, broken blood vessel! You've been warned. The Sports Fix.
Hey guys, before we go to the break, I want to talk to you a little bit again about our good friends at Harry Buffalo North Olmstead. Of course, you know during Brown season, we're there each and every week. What a fun time it was last year. But not just that, so many more reasons for you to check out the Harry Buffalo today. The UFC, the ultimate fighting championships, some of the hottest fights in the world today. Each and every one of their huge events Harry Buffalo is one of the few places in Northeast Ohio you can go there and watch each and every UFC fight at the Harry Buffalo. And let me tell you, I've been there. The people are out the door. They are to the rafters. It is one of the craziest environments for some UFC fights. Wing Mondays, they've got great deals on wings and drinks. And every day of the week, there's a different special, a different deal. And don't forget the Bison Burger, the unbelievable. It is the combination of a fantastic burger and eating healthy combined into one unbelievable sandwich you have got to get a bison burger while you're there so whatever you're looking for whatever day of the week monday through friday saturday sundays there's something for you at the harry buffalo north olmstead just outside great northern mall check them out today harry buffalo join the herd hey this is s1 jameson and you listen to the sports fix whether it's an oil change or a new set of tires Quick Lane at Valley Ford Truck has you covered for your car care needs. They're your neighborhood quick service experts. They also offer a low price tire guarantee. Choose from 13 brands, and if you find the same tires at a lower price within 30 days, Quick Lane at Valley Ford will refund the difference. 5715 Canal Road, right under the 480 Bridge in Valley View. Come see why life is better in the Quick Lane. Quicklane.com slash Valley Ford Truck. The Sports Fix is now available every day on the world's largest internet radio service, iHeartRadio. Download the free iHeartRadio app, subscribe to the show, and get get your fix. fix. No football? No problem at Harry Buffalo North Olmstead. The excitement never stops. Every day of the week brings a different set of food and amazing drink specials. And now... Fans, Harry Buffalo North Olmstead is the home for every UFC pay-per-view live on the big screens. Let's get it all! And let's not forget their mouth-watering trademark, the Bison Burger. They sure are good. Nobody does bison like Harry Buffalo. The perfect combination of healthy and delicious. Hey there, eat up, y'all. You this good church-going folk. Y'all deserve a little treat. What are you waiting for? Get to Harry Buffalo, just outside Great Northern Mall today. Harry Buffalo, Harry Buffalo. join the herd. Join the herd. Hi, this is Dean Chenoweth, head coach of Cleveland's Lake Erie Monsters, and you're listening to the Sports Fix. Welcome back to the Sports Fix Live here on the SportsFix.net and all the other platforms and applications and doohickeys and all of that. Welcome in each and every one of you. J-Rock back with you as we wrap things up here for the day. Heading into the, uh, man, there's a lot going on here this afternoon. Of course, the U.S. World Cup soccer action, Belgium. Let's see if they can advance here in the tournament. I think the other game today, which would be the winner of who that team would face, Argentina and the Swiss. They're in extra time. I think they're at uh, 102 minutes and counting there. And no score, man. Again, incredible athletics. And I give you all the credit in the world, but 102 minutes at no score. It sounds like the Indians' last couple of games. But, uh, hey, so well, there we go. I mean, we're soccer fans, too. We just didn't know it. But that's it. Indians, see, Indians are just getting into the World Cup spirit lately. That's all they're doing. (laughs) Tonight, let's see if that snaps. I'm going to tell you now, there's no way in hell that we are coming back here tomorrow talking about any kind of history being made and all this garbage that we were joking about earlier. The Indians, uh, Josh Beckett always been strong against the Indians in his career, but uh, Indians are going to go out here and put something down. Hey, the Dodgers, by the way. This is, I was telling my son last night, this was, I didn't even realize it on the air. This was not only my World Series prediction at the beginning of the season, but uh, as I pull back to who we all picked, all the various uh, Indians 
talkers on the show. Uh, the Dodgers were four of the six people's selections to make the World Series, and uh, they've definitely gotten back on the track, and they're on that swing. Uh, actually, myself and Dan Wismar had the Indians and the Dodgers. Uh, Gorman and Al Chimichella had the Tigers and the Dodgers in the World Series. Mike Brandenberry, the only person on the panel who did not have the Indians making the playoffs this year, Got to give him his credit there. Boston and the Nationals in the World Series. And Jonathan Knight had Detroit and St. Louis. But uh, Mike Brandeberry, the only one of us who didn't have the Indians winning either the division or the wild card here this season. But uh, Indians and Dodgers, to me, a potential World Series preview. I know that looks miles away from here with the uh, with the way the first half of the season has gone for the Indians. But, uh, man, I'm sticking to it. Let's see how they go out there and play. This is some good baseball, though. We have, we've had a stretch here, even the last three games, man. I know that the Indians have come on the short end of the ledger on two out of the three of them. But if you are a baseball guy, does some great baseball the last couple of days here that have been played. And I think tonight, if Masterson doesn't go out there and lay an egg on the road, which he's prone to do, if he goes out there and gives you good Justin Masterson tonight, then we could be looking at another consecutive uh, good game here. Either way, Indians got to get a victory here as they sit. What are we now? Two and five on this road trip with two games to go. They, you've got to you got to split at least here these next two. But tonight, Josh Beckett, Justin Masterson, some more late night Indians baseball as we head towards the end of this road trip, and then they come back home. We said a lot of the big uh, promotions coming up this weekend should be some big crowds at Progressive for the July weekend. Always good. Matter of fact, the last non-opening day sellout before this past series with Detroit that we had with Omar was Fourth of July weekend last year. So wouldn't surprise me if they approached that. I, I would have said for sure they would have if they hadn't didn't kind of have the bad run in that that's that series with Detroit, and then these last couple of games here. I would have said a no-brainer. Another 100,000 weekend coming up because you know you're going to get a big crowd for the Friday night, 4th of July fireworks. They may sell out both of those games, Friday and Saturday, I think, uh, regardless of, of how they're playing. Just because it's 4th of July weekend and the fireworks there. But uh, I highly doubt that they, they they test the numbers that they did in that Detroit weekend. And you're and the Indians fans will probably be gun shy on, on doing that until uh, they get a little bit of a winning streak going here. But anyways, got to get home first. Tonight, you got the Dodgers. Looking forward to talking about it tomorrow. Dan Wismar will be here. Always a good time when he's with us. And then we will, we're will we going to wrap things up tomorrow. So we're definitely going to open up the phone lines tomorrow. You guys will get your chance to chime in before we take the uh, long, extended weekend. Let me tell you guys, I, <laughs> I, for, I, I was debating whether I was even going to talk about this on the show, but well, uh, just what the hell yesterday, right? I'm uh, doing some work after the uh, show and then went away, came back to the office in the evening and uh, watching the Indians game, doing some work last night. And uh, uh, I was going through uh, this might have been before the game. I don't know. Whatever. When whenever the Twitter uh, journalists, uh, some of the other radio hosts here in Cleveland, etc. Who was the first one? May have been Rizzo. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, one of the guys from ESPN or something tweeted, uh, I've got it from a source in the Cavs. Kyrie is going to sign five-year max extension. Oh, two minutes go by. Here comes some guy from 92. I've got it from my source just got off the phone. Kyrie Irving's going to sign a max con- And I saw about eight of these. But so in a matter of a couple of minutes. And uh, so I replied to the one guy and I said, amazingly funny coincidence because I was mocking Twitter because it drove me nuts. I said, your source confirmed it right after this guy's source confirmed it at the same time that this guy's did. And you all posted one right after the other on Twitter. Amazing how everybody's sources were staggered. You would almost think that one person saw a tweet and then copied what the other person said, etc., cetera, et cetera, all claiming their sources. But no, that's not what happened. They just all happened to get the word a minute or two apart from each other. Get out of here. And then uh, Dennis Maniloff from the Cleveland Plain Dealer decided to reply to one of my comments. Oh, well, well, it doesn't matter where the source is. I trust him. He's got good news. I'm like, hey, 
Everybody's got good sources. My sources told me the same thing when I just made a phone call. I mean, we're probably all calling the same people. I don't care about that. I was mocking the the Twitter journalism, and here he came to save the day, the D-man. No offense, Dennis Maniloff, but you're the guy who the plane dealer spent two years making write a column every Monday to explain to you how the performance you saw yesterday from Brandon Whedon wasn't as bad as you thought it was, and his entire job was to convince you every Monday how great Brandon Whedon was going to be. And if you think I'm wrong, go back over the last two football seasons and look at Dennis Manilov's uh, column after every Browns game. His job was to sell you on Brandon Whedon. So look, brother, your credibility is a little bit shot with me. But I just, I got a kick because he was coming at me and I'm like, you're not getting it. I'm not mocking individual people. I am mocking this whole Twitter sources journalism garbage that we see all the time. Any one of you can go on your timeline right now and scroll down and in 30 seconds, I guarantee you at least 10 different people and half of them don't work for any media outlet will have a quote that says something like, my sources tell me blank. I guarantee you, you can't get away from it, and it drives me nuts. But yesterday was just such a cut and dry example of it. I literally watched one after another, and it was staggered as if, I don't know, as if somebody went on Twitter and said, oh, man, I better hurry up and tweet this out, too. My sources told me Kyrie's going to say, I got a kick out of that. So somebody's sources got a call every 60 seconds, apparently. It was, just, it was so perfectly staggered that you would have to be a complete moron to look at it and just not realize what happened. Literally, one person said it first. Eight other people copied it over the next couple of minutes, and yet somehow everybody called their source at the exact same time, but they didn't post it at the same time, of course. One person, then another person, then another person. But anyway, so guys... I'm telling you, man, I feel sorry, really, for some of the people who the hardcore fans who they want to know. So they go on and they have but they subject themselves because they, they have they have that's where they go. They go to Twitter and they're they're just hit with. And I just people say, J-Rock, why don't you tweet all the time? Why aren't you always on Twitter? I say, you know why? Because Twitter, as much as I value some of the cool things that it can do, it drives me crazy. I can't sit on it because Everybody on it knows better than everybody. Every, and I, when I say I shouldn't say that because I should be fair. There are some great people. Listen, Twitter, it's just like society. The problem is to me is Twitter is more the bad parts of society than the good. And maybe it's because it takes a large amount of hubris to simply think that the world needs to hear your opinion every 15 seconds. Like that really, no offense, that's the society we live in. I mean, I... I don't post as Jerry Myers on Twitter. I have a sports fix Twitter account. You know, I, I could care less about telling anybody anything that I do during the day. Cause who cares? I don't even care what time I had breakfast, but anyways, um, so everybody on Twitter knows better than everybody else. Everybody is the only person that knows nobody's ever watched anything. I mean, the, it's just, I could tell you any time of day what I'm going to find a random slice through Twitter, you know? And it's just so, that's one of the reasons, and I don't want to be that guy, man. And I'm just, I'm not going to do that. I mean, if you want to know who 17 people's sources told you all at the same time, just go follow them all on Twitter. They'll all tweet one right after another. Nobody is coming to me for breaking news. I'm not that guy. Every once in a while, I get something before everybody else. Most times, I get it right around the same time as everybody else. And I just figure, why rush to go tweet something out? that everybody's doing right. And then I look at the timeline and I go, did they really need one more person? Do they really need the sports fix to tweet out? So, and so, you know, David DeLucci is signed with the Indians. I mean, really 17 other people just told you, do you really need me to tell you to? So a lot of times that's why, and sometimes I'll do it. Like if I've got the phone in my hand and something breaks, or if I get a text and I happen to have, obviously if I get a text, I've got my phone in my hand, but if I happen to get something and I'm able to, then yeah, I'll jump on and say, Hey, I just found this out, but I don't go race. I don't play the Twitter race. I don't play the breaking Twitter race. I don't try to blow you away by being the first person to tell you anything. Because, number one, that's how mistakes get made. The few times that I've caught myself getting caught up in that, and not even, like, intentionally, just 
just getting caught up in stories and all of a sudden I'm getting some breaking stuff at a trade deadline or something. I end up feeling, I don't want to say dirty afterwards, but I do. I almost go, you know what? This is more trouble than it's worth here. And it's just because you're, you're sent, you're sending out some stuff that's half verified and you, you know what? I'll just stay back and talk about it when we actually have something to talk about. So man, but I feel bad for people that, that, you know, don't sort through the sources and that sit there and just get done. I half the time when people come up to me with some half cocked thing and they go, Hey, have you heard this? I go, let me guess. Saw it on Twitter. Yep. And, and so whatever it is, what it is, have fun with it. It's fun. It's social media. Like you can have fun and there's, there's great aspects. Sometimes man, it can get stuff out there just like that, but just like that same thing, that's a bad thing sometimes too, but the Twitter sources and maybe it's everywhere. And I'll tell you what, those of you guys listening in other towns, hit me up and tell me, is it just a Cleveland thing? Cause sometimes I blame it on the media here in Cleveland. And I say, we've just got some really bad quote unquote I don't even know if you call them all media but we've got some really bad ones here in Cleveland but maybe it's everywhere maybe it's everywhere because I see the national people doing the same thing and uh, and it's just it's funny it's fun it's funny and it's sad but uh, so anyways it's just I'm telling you yesterday <laughs> I I could probably scroll back except we follow so many people that it would take me forever to find this time yesterday, but I could read them to you one after another. And they all sounded almost exactly the same. Just got off the phone with my sources. Kyrie Irving will sign the fight. And I'm like, amazing. You all have staggered simultaneous sources, man. One right after another. Hey, you sure? You sure you weren't just repeating what the other guy said? All right, I'll back off, D-Man. Anyways, but so, so hey, guys. Anyway, that's that's why I I'm not on Twitter anywhere near as much as as uh, as you would think, you know. Because why, you know? Uh, anyways, but uh, and those of you that are, that's cool. Hey, listen, man. There's some people that that are on it from the time they wake up until the time they go to sleep, and that's awesome. If that's your thing, that's cool. Not my thing, not our thing. All good. Doesn't have to be. But uh, you can still tweet with us at the Sports Fix CLE. I'll read it. I'll answer it. I'll retweet it. I'll send it out to other people. We'll still interact with you. I'm just not the guy to go to for the breaking Twitter drama. I'm not the- not that guy at all, man. All right, we're going to wrap things up, call it a day here, another Tuesday in the books. Thanks to my man, Dr. Football, for being with us. Thanks to... Mike Brandeberry from did the tribe win last night.com. Thanks to each and every one of you guys as always, because we can't do it without you. This is your show. It's like you show up. Nobody else is here. It's, it's your show. So thanks to each and every one of you guys for being with us here today. A lot going on today. Go USA. Try to take that Belgian dip baby and move on in the world cup. Indians late night tribe live. Justin Masterson, Josh Beckett, 10, 10 tonight. Go tribe, go team USA. Come back here tomorrow guys. And, and talk to us last show of the week live right here. Same bad time, same bad channel. Noon tomorrow on the Sports Fix. We love you, Cleveland. We'll see you then. Have a good one. We'll see you tomorrow. Some of the greats here, Midwest best, this is MGK's, yeah. Shouts out to St. Clair, Uptown, yes, y'all. Heading to the flats, get it popping up with Steph Floss. Old state monster, this the home of King James. We are not the empire, but this is where the kings play. Cleveland. Cleveland. Cleveland.